How you doing, everybody? Sorry for the uh, confusion. Oops. There we go. Okay. Well, we got 16 folks. <laughs> Not too bad. Oh, 17. Here we go. Here we go. Not too bad. 18. Great. Great. Very good. Okay. All righty. Well, I'm a little bit on my back foot this morning, folks. So I apologize about that. Um, I was under the impression we were going to have in person in room 110 this semester. So I'm a little disappointed that we won't get to meet uh, face to face just yet, but uh, we will struggle on with this. Uh, if there's any good news that can come from this, can you all hear me okay? Is everything good? Okay. I can hear you. If there's anything good that's going to come from all of this is that um, the uh, shell of the class is just like my online class from the spring. So that's good news because none of that uh, will change with the exception of a couple of homework assignments that will inform you to uh, deliver them in person and that of course won't be possible so it'll become uh, an online submission once again. Um, and then I'm going to have to convert all of the, uh, the lecture assignments to uh, a response text like I did last semester. So um, not much is going to change as far as the presentation, the information, all of the other stuff, the structure of the class is all going to remain basically the same. So I think hopefully that's good news uh, for all of you. Um, so let's, uh, I want to take, um, <laughs> I'm kind of, uh, I'm a little bit thrown. So just give me a, just give me a moment or two here to collect myself. But um, what I want to do is um, I want to present you with um, the, uh, the initial uh, uh, syllabus and the course outline, talk to you a little bit about stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm hastily closing windows like crazy here <laughs> to try and access the course. So um, let's go through some of that. Uh, we've only got six weeks, so I'm going to have to cram a little bit of the what would normally be the week one um, introductory class uh, in with today's session. So um, it's going to be a mixed bag today. Stick around. It should be fun to watch Professor Walsh struggle. <laughs> um, okay, so let me share my screen here really quick. Uh, that's good. Okay, so now let me go to our home page here. Yes, admit all. Can I do that? Can I do that? Okay, uh, so here we are, cinematography one. So uh, that's what I want to get to that admit window and I, there he is, boom, there we go. Uh, here's the homepage. So hopefully this uh, navigation will work uh, pretty simply for you. Um, always be on the lookout for announcements like case in point today, and y'all did a good job of, of catching this on the rebound. Um, sometimes I'll have to send you um, an announcement um, about a change of something or maybe an addition of something or something I want you guys to know about. Um, so check the announcements a couple of times a week, if you would, please, just so that you're uh, current with the course. Um, are you guys, anybody here have uh, an online or face-to-face -face, uh, session this summer on campus? Or are you all pretty much going to be uh, online? I have an in-person class. Do you? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm currently in the class that uh, we normally teach this course in. Oddly enough, it was empty and available this morning, and um, I don't know. So anyway, um, let's start here at the starting line. And it's going to take us to section one. Okay. Uh, section one is actually the second section on the modules uh, structure of this class. If you take a look on the modules button, I've got a whole bunch of stuff here called getting started. Okay. Um, so actually, I'm going to go back to this. Uh, please don't forget 
and you probably get told this in every class and, and I understand if it's boring and repetitive, but um, you do have a financial aid assignment. Uh, it's a real quick question. Just answer it. You can put, plug in anything really, because all it is is it's just going to catalog your response and you're going to tick over with the folks that are uh, tracking you for your uh, FAFSA uh, financial aid. The, the question is, uh, how many Academy Award nominations has Roger Deakins received from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences? So um, this is a cinematography class. So Roger Deakins is a cinematographer. Uh, he's a working uh, creative uh, individual in Los Angeles. Uh, his most recent film um, that has been released was uh, 1917, uh, the World War I uh, epic. Um, he did uh, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, if you are not aware of Roger, he also did um, movies like um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, uh, Skyfall, um, lots, of, lots of good stuff. So uh, tell me if you can, uh, how many nominations he's received for the Academy Award in his, uh, so far in his career. Um, and that's your uh, financial aid assignment. So just do that and then you're on the uh, you're on the radar uh, for the FAFSA, okay? Um, setting up for success. This is a boilerplate uh, uh, page. Um, it's uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You've probably seen it before in other classes. So I don't want to really bore you with it here. Um, what I want to do is move on to some of the more meaty stuff. So uh, technical support, th these are some quick links in case you have IT problems or if you got problems with your, uh, your web browser or whatever. Um, I've stuck those in there for you. Um, the syllabus is here. Uh, now it's funny because um, it's been, uh, this one might be modified to, to tell us uh, we're in room 110. Ignore that, we're online. Um, I just readjusted all of the important dates down at the bottom, um, stuff that you need to, to know here in the course of the semester, uh, Friday the second. So that's when your, everything is happening on Friday, I guess your financial aid assignment is due on Friday. Uh, your ad drop is also, uh, due on Friday, uh, July 2nd. Okay. So don't forget that. Uh, we've only got one holiday uh, for the summer session. It's the 4th of July. Okay, 4th of July happens on a Sunday this year. Uh, and so what's happening is the campus is celebrating the, the independence holiday uh, on the 5th, on Monday. Uh, now we are suddenly online. So that's probably not going to have much of an effect on us. Uh, what, you, what you can do is just access the course. Uh, like you normally would, and the information will be there. So uh, on that particular day, I think it will be into module 1.3 at that point. Uh, so you can access it at your leisure now. So this is, it, it actually ironically might go a little bit more smoothly uh, as a result of this change. Uh, but that's our only holiday uh, for the semester. Uh, I'm going to show you the course outline in a second, give you a, a sense of what we're doing. Uh, but you can access this document anytime you want. Uh, it is in the startup uh, portion of the, uh, the module menu. Um, anything really to point out? Um, this stuff I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, course catalog description, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all pretty standard stuff. Uh, go through it uh, at your leisure. Um, don't worry about the COVID stuff now. Um, we're all at home. So um, that's uh, not really going to apply. Um, okay, supplementary or optional text, required texts. Okay, so I have one required text for the class and it's this one. It's the, uh, the uh, Tanya Hosier uh, Introduction to Cinematography. Um, it's a really nice volume. I got the paperback because uh, they're cheaper. Um, you will use this book this semester uh, you'll also use it to some extent in, uh, if you elect to take cinematography too, you'll use it for that class as well. So it's kind of like getting, you know, double your pleasure, double your money uh, when you buy the textbook because you'll be able to use it for a couple of classes. So I think that's a good thing. Now I have hunted high and low to find a PDF 
version of it that I could post uh, in the class for you guys. And I just have not been able to find it. I've, I've exhausted all of my resources, um, but I have given you the other uh, optional materials uh, in the form of a bookshelf. And so I'm gonna show you that in a few minutes. So your optional supplementary texts, uh, the ASC manual, the camera assistance uh, manual, uh, there's a filmmaker's guide to production design, uh, which we'll touch on a little bit uh, in this semester and then we'll, we'll use again in cinematography too, if you join me there. Um, Motion Picture Lighting by Blaine Brown and Cinematography Theory and Practice by Blaine Brown. I used to use the Brown book as my official text for Cinematography 1 and 2. I found that it was a little bit lacking and, and the structure of the textbook was a little confusing. Uh, so I've, I'm still drawing from a few uh, materials that are in that text, um, but rather than have you buy it for those isolated moments, uh, I'm going to give you a PDF copy that you can access on your bookshelf. Okay. Um, the basis for your grade at this point, the assignments, everything's going to stay the same for the course. Um, like I said, I had to restructure a couple of assignments for in-person submission, uh, which we will now not be doing. Um, so everything will be an online submission. Um, and it breaks down uh, more or less like this. So you have your financial aid assignment. You're going to have nine uh, assignments in a variety of uh, modes. Um, there's a discussion post. There's a... Um, a, a research paper, there's a, a couple of shooting assignments, um, and there's a couple of worksheets. Um, so there's a mixed, it's a mixed bag of assignments. Hopefully they uh, uh, will keep you engaged. You have a midterm exam, which is, I should really reword that and call it midterm quiz. It's, it's 30 questions based on the first uh, half of the semester. Uh, the final exam is 60 questions, and so it's Basically, you know, some version of, of the initial 30 questions in your midterm and then 30 questions uh, relative to the final uh, portion of the course. Uh, and then you have an attendance participation grade. Uh, I would normally in an in-person class just take attendance and, th and that would be how it works. Um, in the online uh, mode, I usually don't take attendance uh, on the Zoom meeting, what I do is uh, Zoom will generate a report for me that tells me who attended uh, the Zoom meeting and how long they were present for the meeting. Um, and I use that as the attendance. Uh, and what I, what I did for my online folks last semester is if you, for some reason, if you can't attend the Zoom session, uh, what you can do is uh, watch the pre-recorded session which now today uh, we're going to have a recorded session of this particular meeting. Uh, I'll put it up on YouTube. Uh, if you if you don't make the live session, you can go to YouTube, uh, watch that recorded session, uh, and then just drop me a note. I saw it. Uh, you covered this and this and this. Uh, I take you probably a minute, minute and a half to to drop me a note, uh, just so that I know that you saw the lecture. Uh, and that, you know, a, a, a brief note or two about what I covered. So I know that you actually saw it. Uh, I had a few clever individuals that realized that they could just send me an, a note that said I saw the video. And I mean, I'll give you credit for that. But here's the thing. It, it seems like a funny joke. And it seems like the joke is on me when you do that. But the reality is that these lectures now and the materials, uh, you know, within web courses, that's all you've got to go on. So if you don't go to the lecture, and you don't hear me talking about this stuff, um, unless you're exceptionally bright, and you're already geared towards cinematography, uh, you're probably not going to do well. Okay, so you want to watch the lectures. Um, don't short change yourself by by not watching. Uh, because I'm going to cover all the, the stuff in those discussions. And um, if you come to the live sessions, obviously you have the benefit of asking questions, which I, I really hope that you will do. Okay. Um, I don't want you to just feel like I'm sitting here and I, you know, one of the limitations that I find the most uh, um, sort of off putting about the, the, the online experience is that um, just like in class, I, I don't want you to feel like you're just sort of tuning into a talking head that's, you know, just talking information at you. Uh, I want you to feel like you can ask questions, even in this forum, uh, it's possible for us to have engaging conversation 
um, which can be really good for everybody. So I, I, I hope and encourage you to ask questions during our sessions. Uh, and especially if you're, you know, if you're having difficulty sorting out the details or, or anything about the topics that we're going to cover. And you should know that um, there's no uh, there's no shame in asking questions in this class. This is a technical class. Um, I have pared it back uh, from what it has been in, in recent years. Uh, I, I, I sort of came to the conclusion that what I was uh, inflicting on students was something akin to a graduate course and not really an undergraduate course. So I, I, I have pared it down and I have tried to extract the salient content from the overall uh, syllabus and, and just present you with the, the, the meaty stuff that you would need uh, to address these issues out in the world uh, on a film. Um, but it's still technical. I mean, there, there's only so much paring down of the information and, and dulling down of the, of the sharp edges that you can do. Uh, and then it's just sort of hunker down and, and get with the information and, and, and process it as best you can. Uh, I know that some of you have absolutely no ambition to be cinematographers when you get out of here. And uh, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, it's not for everyone. I understand that. But hopefully what I can convince you of this semester is that uh, it can benefit you to have a knowledge of this craft work. It can benefit you um, no matter what uh, uh, discipline you decide to pursue when you get out of college. Uh, for instance, um, I mean, obviously directors are gonna benefit from cinematography knowledge. Uh, when you're in pre-production on a major feature film, for instance, um, a lot of directors, uh, you know, as far as the crew goes, they're the first person hired. I mean, obviously the producers are there, you know, and probably the accountants because that's necessary. Uh, and then the director's hired and, and that director might sit around for several weeks before uh, folks start rolling in, you know, getting hired. So uh, in order for you to be able to effectively begin your preparation on a feature film, uh, you know, you, it, it's good for you to know things like, you know, how shots work, what, how lenses work, um, you know, what movement options are available to you uh, as, a, as a filmmaker and, and how they integrate into your coverage and how you, how you turn a a printed document into a visual experience for an audience and communicate all the information within that written document. Um, so directors hope, uh, are certainly going to benefit from this course. Um, production designers, if that's your thing, uh, it may comfort you to know or it may scare the heck out of you to know that as a cinematographer, I work very closely with production designers. They are, they're critical. Uh, you know, I, I can know all the camera tricks in the world, but if I don't have anything good to look at in terms of sets, uh, actors, costumes, makeup, uh, we're all just wasting our time. So production designers, you could consider them, you know, of the director's right-hand people, you got the cinematographer and the production designer, and they're both sort of there to help the director uh, create visually the message that they're communicating uh, through the script. So production designers uh, benefiting from this. Um, obviously, if you wanna be in the camera department when you get out of school, you're gonna benefit from this class. Uh, gaffers, I was a gaffer for many years, uh, working both on the East Coast and uh, in Hollywood out in California. Uh, before I moved up to a shooting uh, cameraman, to a cinematographer. So if you're interested in lighting, and when I say lighting, I also mean grip because they go part and parcel. Uh, if that's your thing, um, you're going to benefit from this class, certainly. Um, hair and makeup. Okay, let's say you want to be uh, part of the, uh, uh, we used to call them the Powder Puff Patrol or the Fru Fru Crew. Um, obviously, those are terms of endearment. Please, nobody uh, take offense at that. But if that's your thing, man, I can't. I can't tell you how many times a makeup person uh, has saved me uh, on a on a film shoot um, by applying certain kinds of uh, topical makeup, 
by um, giving the actors a pat down when some of my lights were a little bit too hard and, and we didn't have time to adjust them with extra diffusion or extra manipulation. Uh, sometimes uh, when we need to uh, um, accentuate the lighting through effective application of makeup. One time I was, uh, I was lighting Dwayne Johnson, you know, The Rock, and I asked uh, for a, a fairly unusual topical application of um, baby oil. Uh, to make all of my light sort of pop on this guy and have him emerge in the frame, not just nice Dwayne, you know, sitting in chair in the studio, but the rock on camera. Uh, and that happened only through the effective uh, application of skilled makeup. So, you know, everybody, set decorators, uh, script supervisors, definitely, if you want to be a script supervisor, uh, knowing cinematography is going to help you because you're going to know what I'm up to, right? And you're going to be making notes as we go along, shot by shot, scene by scene, uh, telling the editors what lenses were used for what pieces of coverage, what uh, kind of movement was taking place in the frame at the time. All of these notes that are flags for the editors to look for when they're searching for uh, clips and, and snippets of, of film and post-production, trying to assemble your, your final edit. Um, Everybody, everybody that I can think of benefits from knowing about cinematography. So if you're a nerd about it, cool, you're in the right place. If you're just here because you have to, because it's a core required class, I feel for you, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to glean something for your own benefit if you just stick with me and, and give me a few moments of your time. Um, I, don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm a particularly tough grader. Uh, I grow more lenient as I get more gray hair. <laughs> um, you may have heard some horror stories. Uh, I would love to convince you that they are not true. I suppose that's all relevant to your point of view. Um, but I take a pretty liberal approach to grading. I'm not here to ding your GPA. Uh, I'm not here to bury you and I'm not here to weed you out. What I'm here to do is give you a functional uh, skill set uh, that you can use moving forward. Uh, and I just want to know that you're absorbing the information and that at some point uh, it will be of service to you if you understand it. Mastery will come with time. Um, I'll expect more performance out of students who take cinematography too, um, but that's an elective course and you don't have to be there. So typically the folks that take courses like that are there because they really want the you know, the extended education. So for us here in the Cinematography One course, uh, I'm just trying to give you some, some good basis for uh, fundamental creative skill sets that you can use moving forward. Um, homework policies. Um, I think I used to be pretty rigid about, you know, uh, due dates and stuff. I'm still, I'm still concerned with due dates because that's something, that's a responsibility that's going to follow you out into the professional world. So uh, if you, you know, uh, don't observe due dates here uh, and you're likely to carry that uh, habit with you out into the real world, you'll find out really quick that that will not serve you. Uh, but what I do allow is late, uh, latest uh, uh, submissions. Uh, it's 10 point per day uh, demerit. So, you know, if you are late by, you know, four days, it's getting to the point where submitting that assignment is um, <laughs> diminishing returns. Um, but it gets you a few more points on the board uh, rather than a zero. So I do take late assignments. Um, just understand that there will be late points applied to anything turned in after the due date. And if you're later than four days, you might as well not bother because at that point you've done enough damage that, um, you know, uh, there's really no point in submitting. Um, media and technology. Okay. So it's not as applicable in an online setting, but um, we do use web courses. Obviously, you have to uh, have a good internet connection uh, wherever you're going to receive this class on Mondays and Wednesdays now. So this will be our time slot, 9 to 12.50. Um, it's on you if your internet service doesn't work, right? Uh, let me know if you're having problems with stuff like that, and, and there might be workarounds, okay? But anytime you're having an issue, you got to get on that problem as soon as possible, okay? Don't wait. Don't wait till the night that something is due to send me an email and tell me that you haven't been able to access web courses. That's not going to do anybody any good. 
okay? Um, if you have a problem, obviously I've given you the, um, the IT uh, uh, contact information in the getting started menu. Uh, so you've got that, you can, you can get them on the line and get them helping you. Uh, if it happens to be that your own uh, home internet service is the thing that's bogging down and creating a problem, it's going to be your responsibility to get somewhere where you can receive service so that you can do your assignments and get everything turned in. Okay, that's a UCF policy. It's not my policy, but I adhere to it because I think that it's it's logical and it, it makes sense. You know, this is an online course now for sure. So you got to have that internet, you got to have a good connection, you got to have it every week, okay? If you want to contact me through email, the best way to do it is through the web courses uh, mailbox, right? So there's a little tab on the left-hand side in the left-hand column, um, and just uh, send me an email through there, okay? Um, I give you my, ooh, I'm sorry, this is my old uh, email. Um, just take nights out of it and you've got my current email, michael.walsh at ucf.edu. Okay, that's my official UCF email. Um, it'll go right to that if you use the web courses tab though. Okay, so just do that. I think that's the best way anyway. It'll help us uh, avoid any, um, any uh, uh, FERPA uh, violations and things of that nature. Don't send me personal emails to personal email addresses if you happen to figure out uh, what some of my, I have a number of outside email addresses and some of them are linked to my websites and things that you may gain access to. Don't communicate to me there, uh, only because we have an instructor student relationship at this point in time. Um, and there are certain um, governing bodies and watchful eyes that are looking for um, um, possible conflicts of interest in terms of your personal uh, privacy and security of your personal information uh, on the internet. So if you want to talk to me, it's best to talk to me through web courses. Okay. It, it's just, it's best for everybody. Um, classroom devices isn't really going to apply. Um, but here's what I can say about devices and about Zoom sessions, for instance. Okay. Um, what a lot of folks like to do, uh, and again, I suppose it, it seems clever, you know, but again, you know, I'm presenting you with information. So if you don't want the information, there's not much I can do uh, about that. Um, but there's a few things that you can do that will convince me that you're engaged and that you are at least trying. Um, and that is, you know, if we have a Zoom session, uh, what a lot of folks like to do is um, check in um, and then turn their camera off and mute their microphone and then they go watch Scooby-Doo or they go with their other device and they go on uh, TikTok or Facebook or something. And, you know, I think I'm talking to a handful of students and in reality, I'm talking to a bunch of place cards and I'm not really uh, uh, um, having a, a meaningful engagement. Okay, I'm still gonna deliver the information because you need to get it and it's a recorded session, but it's nice to, to see your faces. I'm trying to learn who you folks are, right? Some of you might've had me for introduction to uh, production. Um, you may have me for uh, writing for television and, and film. Uh, you, obviously you have me here. You may have me in cinematography too. Uh, ultimately you may have me in your capstone class. Uh, we're going to see each other, and I'm trying to learn who you are. Um, I can't put a face with a name if all I see is a black card with your name on it. I don't know who you are, right? And here's the thing about the film industry that you may be figuring out here, and if not, I'm going to give you a little piece of advice. If they don't know who you are, they're never going to call you, okay? There's too many folks that want this out there in the world, okay? And what you have to do at every opportunity is look for those areas and, and discover those ways that you can set yourself apart from uh, the crowd of, comp of competition, okay? If somebody knows who you are by virtue of your demonstrated work ethic, your yield, what you have created, um, if they know you through conversation or through meetings or through um, correspondence of some kind, if they recognize your work, 
uh, or your name or your face and 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 they associate that with you and, and the complexity of who you are as a filmmaker. These are all good things, okay? But you can't expect that kind of um, meaningful integration into the community at large when you get out of school if nobody knows who you are. The best way for you to start doing that is to introduce yourself, come to these come to these live sessions ask questions let's talk okay um and it's good practice for you when you get on the outside because there's going to be a lot of that networking is everything when you get out into the industry uh if you don't know how to do it you're probably not going to succeed or get very far uh, unless you're a, a dynamic technician of some kind um, and then people will seek you out but that's kind of rare usually everybody needs to take advantage of the community uh take advantage of networking and make yourself known it, it's it's just good practice it's it's the way to be a professional and it all starts here these these habits start here in, in school so um try to you know try to do it you know i know it's hard sometimes uh, i was a huge social misfit when i was younger i mean you know i super film nerd but if you got me well if you got me at a party and, and there was nothing on the line uh, yeah, I'm a great wingman, right? But if it was like a, a, a business party, uh, I was very um, self-conscious and, and very reluctant to sort of open up and, and, and sort of uh, socialize on a professional level. Uh, and it took a long time for me to get over that anxiety. So I understand if that's how you feel, just do what you can to, to work it out because it'll, it'll pay dividends in the long run. Um, that's the synopsis of my syllabus. Um, so let's, let's move on from here and I'll just show you the outline of the class, um, for the semester. Okay. And it's broken into, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to 13. I think we'll get as far as 14, which is, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop this semester at three point lighting. Yes, I am. Um, there was something that I used to do at the tail end of cinematography one that I've now sort of rolled into cinematography uh, two, which is uh, scene coverage and shot design. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you folks. So I'm going to cover these basic topics here this semester. We got an introduction. We're going to talk about who's in the camera department, what their roles are and responsibilities. I'm going to talk to you about a few role models show you the reels, talk to you about who they are as cinematographers. And then I'm going to encourage you to do a, uh, uh, a little research paper. Don't be scared. I'm not asking you to do, you know, graduate level work here. I'm not asking you to do a term paper. This is like, I don't know, two pages, uh, three pages, maybe. Uh, I'm going to give you a list of cinematographers. I'm going to give you the uh, active roster from the American Society of Cinematographers. Um, and then I'll give you an older roster that have some folks that unfortunately have passed on that are not on the current uh, active list. Um, and I want you to pick somebody, right? For some of you, it's going to be darts at a board, right? You don't know any of these names from page eight. So pick one, it doesn't really matter, right? That's fine. Uh, because what I'm going to encourage you to do is go online. Uh, and find out who these folks are. Uh, look at their body of work. See if you can figure out some things about them. Uh, tell me something uh, about them personally. Um, tell me about their style. Tell me you know, what you like about their work. Tell me about how they move the camera, if they use any special gear, something. Give me some information about these cinematographers. Now, do I need to know this information? No. In fact, the active roster that I'm going to give you, you're going to notice, notice that some of the the names are highlighted in yellow, okay? That means I either know them personally or I've worked with them before or both, okay? Uh, so as a professional, you need to be aware of who these individuals are because you're probably gonna bump into them at some point, okay? And it's nice for you to know who you're working with. Uh, so I don't necessarily need to know, but I want you to give me some meaningful information about these individuals for your own edification and to show me that you actually did some research, okay? Um, don't just go onto YouTube and give me a YouTube link and a bibliography of one entry and say that that's your research for uh, what we call the C-spot papers, the cinematography spotlight. Do a little something, you know, 
go to the ASC website and read the bio on the cinematographer. Check out their reel on YouTube. You can do that. Um, maybe there's a, maybe there's a wiki reference for these folks on uh, Wikipedia. Maybe there's not. There's certainly interviews. Uh, there are articles. Some of these folks are uh, definite uh, avid article writers, or they've been interviewed dozens of times by uh, magazines like American Cinematographer or HD Video Pro or uh, you know, any one of these uh, online outlets like Cinema, uh, Cine D or um, No Film School. Um, so there's content out there on virtually anybody on the active roster list for the American Society of Cinematographers. Get at least three resources that you can put in a bibliography and then give me some information. Tell me what you found out about these folks. You may be surprised. A lot of these people um, are probably going to be uh, responsible for some of your favorite films and you might not even realize it, okay? So um, treat this as an opportunity for a little bit of discovery. Uh, and if you're not really familiar with cinematographers and if you're not used to um, hearing their names or uh, thinking consciously about their work and what they're doing, this will be a good introduction to that position, that crew position. Uh, through this little uh, creative paper that you're going to write, okay? Um, in terms of camera department, like I said, I'm going to show you uh, the individuals in the department, tell you the positions, what the job responsibilities are, and so forth. And then I'm going to change gears. We're going to talk a little tech for a while. We're going to talk about media and storage. And I want to talk to you about the, the major difference between film as a recording medium and digital now. Uh, what we're doing with these cameras now in terms of how we record, uh, how we store, and how we manage the assets that we create in our cinema cameras. Um, nothing too heavy duty, um, but it, it should give you uh, uh, some awareness, for instance, about how to choose recording media, what the, what the um, concerns are with uh, recording media, SD cards versus CFast, for instance, how they record data, how much data you can get on a recording media card, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about camera types, uh, what kinds of equipment is out there, uh, what, times of, what types of stuff you're gonna see on set, uh, equipment that you guys have access to yourselves. Um, you will have a couple of shooting assignments and you will be able to, if you elect to do this, uh, because the campus will be open, um, is you can uh, check out camera equipment. Uh, in the past, I've had students that already had their own um, digital video gear of some fashion or another, and that's great. If you have it, cool, you're ahead of the game. Uh, if you don't, uh, what, what they have here at UCF uh, for you folks to use uh, are the Panasonic Lumix, Lumix cameras. This is the uh, um, FZ1000. Okay, and it is basically uh, just like a GH5, except that it has a built-in, uh, like a Dykemar zoom lens, a very Elmerit, uh, and it's uh, 12 to, uh, what is that? No, 9 to, 100 and, 9 to 146, which is essentially, um, in layman's terms, 25 mil to 400 millimeter lens. So it's a nice sort of built-in zoom lens in this camera. Um, it takes a really wonderful um, HD image. It'll also shoot 4K if you want to shoot high resolution. Um, so if you don't have anything else to use and you want to do your shooting assignments with a, uh, you know, a cinema camera, uh, you can check these out from uh, UCF. I give you instructions in the assignments on how to do that. Um, who to talk to, the, the forms that you have to submit in order to check out the gear. Uh, and all of that is laid out for you in the assignments. If you have your own equipment, that's great too. You can use your own gear. I encourage that as well. Um, or, you know, you can do this. Okay. But here's the thing about the cell phone. And this is what I have come to understand uh, even now about devices like the cell phone in terms of uh, using it as a cinema camera. Whether you're using this or you're using the Panasonic or you're using the Ursa Mini 
um, 4.6K that we have here, the studio cameras or a RED camera or an Airy Alexa or a Panaflex film camera, okay? The, the difference is how you approach your, your image creation, okay? And what I have found, and I came to this realization not too long ago, um, and I was just talking to a colleague about it uh, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, when I put something like this in my hand, I have a tendency to thinking about the images that I'm creating from the point of view of a point and shoot sort of, you know, um, non-professional sort of spontaneous event. And I don't think about it as a cinematic approach to an image, right? because it's also my telephone and it's a video game platform if you want it to be. And it's a, it's a social media access terminal. <coughs> it's a lot of things. And also it's a, it's also a video camera, right? Um, but I, I notice when I pick up, for instance, my Ursa mini camera, my 4.6K Pro, right? When I pick up that camera, immediately my brain kicks into cinematographer mode. I know when I pick up that tool, what I'm, how I'm supposed to behave with it, what I'm going to be doing with it, and how I'm going to approach image creation as a result of that tool, right? When I put this in my hand, I'm confused. I don't know whether to think of it as a phone, a video game, a social media terminal, or a camera, right? And so it's possible to then not treat this as a cinematic tool and take videos at that point. I'm going to call them videos for lack of a better word. Okay. In other words, they don't feel like crafted images to me. Unless that's the way you think of this device. Now, if you have a different relationship with your telephone, then that's a personal thing. Any tool that a creative individual uses is a very personal choice. Okay. It's not always dictated to you um, by a producer. Now in the film business, it's not uncommon for a producer to say, yeah, you know what? The only money we have, uh, the only camera we can afford to use on this film is uh, a red scarlet camera. So that's what you get, okay? I know you like the Aria Alexa or I know you would love to shoot film on this feature, but we don't have the money for it. It's not in the budget. Uh, so you're gonna have to shoot this on a Canon 5D or you know, uh, a Blackmagic cinema camera, okay? Or a GH5. Okay, and then what the professional does is they scale their expectations about that equipment and they channel their creative uh, uh, intention through that device and they apply it based on the benefits or limitations of that tool. It's just a tool, in other words. So a good professional, uh, a cinematographer, for instance, uh, could pretty much take any tool that you hand them and create a well-crafted image that has drama and meaning and, you know, visual uh, appeal, right? Uh, it tells a story, okay? And the fact that you did it on a phone is not necessarily the biggest drawback or the biggest obstacle for uh, creating. Okay, so if you're going to use this, and I'm not going to discourage you from using it, but if you're going to use it, avoid the trap. Okay, avoid the trap of, of just sort of using this as, uh, you know, uh huh, yep, yeah, I'm shooting this and I'm shooting this and I'm going to call this a movie or a film project and I'm going to turn it in as my homework. You're not going to get a good grade if you do that. Okay, because that's not using the skills or the uh, the criteria, the creative criteria that we talk about that is the cinematic approach to image making, okay? Some folks can turn in dynamic cell phone videos. And I know that it just happens to be their tool of preference. Like uh, the, the, the buddy I was talking to yesterday, he's a writer out in LA and he was, you know, talking up his new Samsung 8K uh, cell phone he has the uh, samsung note galaxy note bazillion i don't know what number they're up to now um shoots 8k video right and and he was talking all about how he's got an 8k video camera and 
and and that's where the discussion about you know uh different courses for different horses you know in other words yeah you might totally think that that 8k cell phone is a good cinema camera i think that it's a phone that takes really good travel videos let's say or really good birthday parties or you know but i would never choose that tool to shoot a feature film uh, so that's my personal preference. But if if you're geared that way, uh, as long as you're using a cinematic approach to your camera work, um, I don't think that the device really matters much at that point. Um, and there might be some very pragmatic reasons for that as well. For instance, you know, uh, you can't afford uh, the most expensive uh, Airy Alexa LF uh cinema camera for your movie what you can afford is uh canon c300 right okay uh that's a different kind of constraint and so you as a cinematographer you you take the virtues of that camera and you play them to their best possible advantage and you try to downplay as many of the uh, limitations of that camera as you can and maybe sometimes you use those limitations as an advantage right but what you certainly don't do is you say well i can't do this because i don't have the alexa camera that i wanted uh if you got to shoot you got to shoot right so you use the gear that you can access in the moment and i always say you know in response to the question, what's the best cinema camera out there? My answer to that question is the one you can put your hands on right now and shoot something if that's what you need to do, right? If you have to shoot today and you have a call sheet or a schedule, you have a, a, a list of, of expectations that you need to uh, uh, fulfill for the producers in order to get paid, uh, and you all, all you got is a Samsung Galaxy Note 12 that shoots 8K, we're going to work, right? And, uh, you know, you do the best you can with that tool. Uh, I don't know if any of you are um, uh, Blake, uh, is it Blake Snyder? Uh, uh, who did a, a really clever um, short film, uh, uh, Steam. Uh, oh gosh, I'll show you guys the link if I can find it. Um, something about a steam engine or something. It was a uh, really interesting uh, short video that he shot on an iPhone uh, and he did it um, as a, a therapeutic exercise uh, if anything else uh, right after um, I think it was the death of one of his children um, and he he sort of undertook the project as a therapeutic measure um, but also uh, sort of keep his uh, mind uh, uh, and creative brain engaged in a period where he wasn't getting a lot of other work done uh, and it's fabulous. I'll show it to you folks if, uh, if I can uh, find the link. Um, because it's indicative of this, this thing that I'm trying to say to you, which is the tool doesn't necessarily matter. What matters are the hands you put the tool in. Okay. So if your approach uh, is a professional one uh, and you can take any tool and, and create dynamic images with it, that's what I'm talking about. That's cinematography to me. Okay, so in that in that uh, guys will talk about cameras, lenses, filters. Uh, talk to you about filtration and what what it can do for you. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about um, some of the complexities of creating the image, um, specifically uh, how to achieve um, correct exposures with cinema cameras, what the factors are involved with that, some of the uh, concurrent phenomenon that result from exposure choices like depth of field. Uh, we'll have a discussion about that in, in, uh, in other words, controlling the zone of focus in and around your subject and what the effects are, what the obvious differences are between certain exposure choices and certain qualities of the image that you recognize right away uh, in terms of, for instance, shallow depth of focus, um, bokeh, um, circles of confusion and, and things of that nature that uh, you probably have seen already and you're, and you're sort of aware of these, these elements um, as aspects of an image, but I'm going to help you put labels on some of these things and understand them from a, a, a more, uh, I don't know if scientific is the right word to use in this case or not, but I'm going I'm to create some awareness for you that, that you can then control. 
and, and control is at the heart of cinematography, right? Uh, I'm going to talk to you about color theory, um, the effects of color um, emotionally, um, what they signify in terms of unspoken dialectic. Um, you know, what does red mean, for instance, when you see the color red? It has a psychological, uh, emotive quality to it, uh, expectations on the part of the audience, passion, anger, love, right? Uh, we'll talk about color theory from that point of view talk about the visible spectrum. We'll talk about what colors are and how they uh, are affected by our video cameras. Um, we'll define some of the, um, the elements of, of, of color, uh, like primary combinations and so forth. Uh, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about the science of color temperature. And, uh, and then we'll talk about lighting. Uh, we're going to talk about three-point lighting in this course. Um, we get into more complex lighting discussions in cinematography too, um, but for now, I want to introduce you to cinematic lighting, a cinematic approach to lighting. So you can walk into a room, like I was kind of sort of tossed in this room this morning when we realized, uh, or when I realized that we weren't going to be in face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, I'm here and I'm under the house lights, right? So I just turned on the room lights. This is you know, my whiteboard and my video screen behind me. So no attention was given to the background. Uh, I'm sort of where I can be, right? This is the space that was allocated for me this morning. The lighting is what it is, right? Is it cinematic? Mm, probably not, right? Is it realistic? Certainly. I'm really sitting in the room and that really is the lighting that's available, right? Would I choose this for a movie though? Probably not. What's the difference? That's what I'm going to talk to you about, okay? The difference between how we would light an image from a movie and how light happens in reality. Sometimes it's very close, very similar, and other times it's vastly different, okay? And so I want to talk to you about that uh, at the end of the semester. Your midterm happens in week eight, halfway through. I think in this case, it's something like July um, 21st. Uh, and it's an online quiz and I leave it open for something like five days. Okay. So <laughs> you got five days to take it. It's 30 multiple choice questions. You get like an hour to take it. Right. Uh, if you can't hit that window of opportunity in, in a five day uh, span of time, uh, I don't know how to help you with your uh, forthcoming career. Um, you gotta, you gotta hit that window. You gotta take the quiz when it's, when it's ready. Uh, if you have some odd extenuating circumstances, uh, like you booked tickets to Greece in the middle of July, uh, and you've had these tickets since March, right. And you're going with family or whatever, then you need to tell me now, right. Don't wait until July 20th at 10 30 p.m. and go oh by the way Professor Walsh I'll be gone for a week on vacation with the family I can't take the midterm I can't help you then right so if we need to address something like that let's do it soon let's do it like today let's do it as soon as you possibly can bring it to my attention so we can have a solution in place for you um, if you just forget you can oversleep on July 21st, but you can't oversleep on July 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th when that when that quiz closes, right? So I overslept is not going to be an excuse for missing the midterm, nor will it be for the final. And I'll tell you why, for very pragmatic reasons. On the final exam, okay, here's how I'm crunched at the end of the semester in the summertime. Uh, your final day of class could be the 6th, but it's not. It's the 4th, I think, of August, right? I open your final on the 5th. I close it on uh, Sunday night at midnight. So the 5th is like a Thursday. So you get Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days to take your final, right? And then I have to have all your grades turned in two days later, okay, and done for the semester. So... I can't have people, you know, claiming on Monday morning that they couldn't take the quiz and they they need to be able to take it right then and there. You know, I can't help you then. It's too late, right? So again, if you anticipate a problem, let me know as early as possible and we'll solve it 
uh, if if humanly possible. Um, but don't tell me on the day. Don't tell me the night before. Then my hands are tied and there's nothing I can do. Okay. Um, so that's the outline of the class, right? Uh, now let's get to some things that are more fun. Okay, here's your bookshelf, all right? Um, so like I said, all the PDFs except the Hosier book uh, are on your bookshelf already. All right, so this is the one that you got to figure out how to rent or buy. Um, I got this one used on Amazon, I think for $35. I think if you buy it brand new from like Taylor and uh, whatever uh, focal press that um, it's like 50 bucks or 60 bucks, right? Um, you can rent it uh, from Amazon. I think it's like maybe $19, I want to say, to rent it on Amazon. Um, I gave you a link uh, to that. Um, it's in here somewhere. We'll stumble across it. Um, Everything else that you might have a reading assignment from is right here, okay? So if you gotta go to the Brown book, uh, here's Theory and Practice, third edition, click on the link, and depending on how fast uh, WPA2 is this morning, it will load up, yeah, I see 828 pages, it's quite a lot, but it will load up right here. Uh, you could all, here it is, and you can also download it um, but you can do your reading right here through web courses if you have to, right? If you want to, if you don't want to be bothered having any sort of hard copy. Uh, what I will say about hard copy though, is there is a definite advantage to owning these books. Um, and that is that if you buy them, if they're a tax deduction, okay? Um, if you're going to be a filmmaker, a professional filmmaker, um, then there are going to be certain things, investments, uh, financially, uh, that you're going to make in your career and in yourself um, that you can account for in your annual income taxes. And textbooks are a write-off, and I don't know if you know this or not, but they are. So even if you buy it new and it costs you 60 bucks, if you can write it off your income taxes as a business deduction, um, it's worth doing. And then you get to have this on your bookshelf for your entire career. And I can tell you that, you know, the information in something like this is definitely advantageous. Um, you know, some of these books in PDF form, if you want to put them on your, on your phone so that you can access them um, when you are on the job, for instance, the ASC manual, the seventh edition right here. Um, this has got a lot of on the job uh, handy charts and diagrams and things that you might want to use uh, in the midst of shooting. Right, and if you have it loaded into your laptop or your uh, your cell phone, if you prefer uh, something like that, and you need to look up, say, depth of field charts or uh, filtration filter factors for calculating exposure, whatever. Uh, here's the black edition. This is the best one. Uh, if you uh, were born in, in the film uh, generation like me. Uh, the black edition was a highly sought after volume. They came in different colors, blue, red. Uh, I think there was a green one at one point. Um, the blue one is most recently associated with digital uh, technology. This is the black edition, supposed to be the best of everything. Um, the red edition was strictly for film uh, content creators. Um, but uh, this has got lots of interesting information in it, okay? I carried, uh, I'm a film brand, so I, my career was almost entirely, my professional career was almost entirely film-based until the very end, and then I switched over radically to digital video at the very end. Uh, and I carried the red American cinematography manual around in my, in my rain gear bag uh, for 30 years, okay? So uh, this is something that uh, could be very handy to you as a document. Uh, and then all these other books are here. I will assign reading assignments from uh, each of these at one point or another. So you'll have to access them at least once in order to do a reading assignment. Uh, and then you can download them if you want. This little icon right here, just download it into your device and then you have it. My gift to you, right? Um, I've also stuck on here recently the glossary of uh, film and lighting terms. This is from the same author as the author of the camera assistance handbook that I've already uh, 
given you on your bookshelf, okay? So David Elkins, who is a professional camera assistant in Hollywood, uh, I believe he's retired now, finally. Uh, he's written a couple of books and uh, everything that he has written, he has always um, graciously allowed academia to quote from, copy from, reproduce and distribute without charge. Um, so you can buy his stuff or you can uh, uh, sometimes stumble across his books in PDF form on the internet and download them and he has no problem with that. Uh, I think that makes him a pretty exceptional individual just for that uh, courtesy that he extends to all of us. Um, but his uh, film and lighting terms uh, glossary is embedded in here. If you hear me, uh, I'll do this from time to time. I'll use a term and maybe not stop to define that term for you. Uh, and if you hear something that you have never heard before and, it, and, uh, and you're reluctant to ask the question or raise your hand in the middle of a lecture, uh, it may very well be defined for you in this glossary. So you can flip over to this really quick and, and what the hell is he talking about? And look it up and get the definition, okay? Um, so that's here for your consumption as well. Uh, with my blessing. Uh, and that takes us to the general discussion board. And I put this on here, okay, really for you guys more so than anything else. So I, from time to time, will put announcements up there for you, right? And so hopefully you're conditioned to check the announcements on a regular basis for communication with your instructor. But you're not going to use the announcement boards for casual conversation and the discussion boards that I assign to you are probably going to have a topic uh, of discussion that you're supposed to be uh, broaching in those assignments. Uh, this is for everything else, right? So if you see a really cool movie and you think that others would benefit from your uh, review or your endorsement and you want to just put a note up here, hey guys, I just saw a blah, blah film and it was wonderful and it's about this and that, and I recommend it highly, or I just read a great article about lenses and it's over here at Video Maker and here's the link and blah, 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 or I'm working on a music video and I need help for next weekend. If you're available, contact me here, let me know, Any, whatever, right? This is your forum to create a little bit of community now, especially with an online um, uh, situation like we have here uh since we're not face to face we don't have the luxury of each other's company uh, a couple of times a week this becomes our you know a, a primary point of contact so use the general discussion board it's um uh, it's for you the only thing i ask is you know be smart right be respectful um no trading insults or I mean, you know what to do, right? It's social media at this point. And so, you know, just be careful with it. Be, be conscientious, be respectful. And, um, you know, it's here for you, right? So uh, that's the general discussion board. And so that takes us through the, um, the getting started portion of the menu uh, on web courses. And then of course, section one, getting right into it is going to be, um, uh, an introduction uh, of the course uh, as a whole. Uh, we can talk a little bit about me. Um, I'm concerned at this point, um, we've now been at this for approximately an hour, maybe a little bit over. And I would like to sort of take a survey of who is here at the moment to ask you, does anybody need to take a break for any reason? Um, or do we need to uh, sort of power through this thing? It looks like there's only six of us left here. Um, so it's really um, okay more than that. Yeah, I, I actually uh, just wanted to get up to get a drink real quick. I, ju I just haven't because I don't want to miss anything important. Okay, well. So I didn't know if it take I, like two minutes to go do that or. Yeah, um, I think uh, some instructors would make you log out and log back in with a new uh, meeting link. Um, since I sort of created this on the fly this morning under duress, uh, I have not 
done that. So I'll just say, if you gotta take a break, go ahead and take a break. Um, I will switch to casual conversation here for about five minutes and allow you uh, a little bathroom break or to re-up your coffee flow, whatever you gotta do. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll dig into who I am and what's going on with this class. And, uh, and we may be able to wrap this up here uh, pretty soon after that. So if you need to go ahead and take a break, feel free to do that now. And um, I'll meet you back here at, uh, I have, 25 minutes to 11 by my watch. So uh, my laptop I see says 20 till 11. So why don't we come back at uh, at quarter to 11, okay? Does that sound uh, good to you guys? That sounds good. Can I ask a question real quick? Absolutely, yes. That's a great time to ask questions. So you mentioned having shooting assignments. I just wondered what might those entail? Mm. One of the shooting assignments is strictly uh, to show me um, some basic compositional arrangement. Um, and then I throw in a little, um, a little uh, skill that we call uh, pulling focus, which we'll talk about in the course of the semester, um, where you'll have to change the plane of focus within your shot from something in the foreground to something in the background. Uh, and, and demonstrate that for me with whatever tool you're using. So uh, some of you might be using the Panasonic camera. Some of you might be using your own uh, video camera. You might be using the cell phone. It is possible uh, to manipulate the plane of focus in your cell phone. Uh, if you use an Apple device, what you have to do is download a third-party app off of your, um, your marketplace uh, application. Um, let me see if I can tell you what is that called? Um, boop -ba -doo. Let's see here. I might already have it on this phone. Um, I've got a variety of different applications here. Um, if you go to your marketplace, your Apple store, for instance, and you type in um, manual camera control for iPhone, uh, and search, it's gonna give you some solutions. In fact, I can do that for you right now. Um, let's see here. I'll go to, yes, search for uh, iPhone manual camera control. Okay, Pro Camera uh, is one app, Pro Cam 8. Uh, Raw Plus, Pro Movie Recorder, Pro Camera Capture, Camera Plus, Manual Camera, Pro Cam looks like the one that's topping the list here. Um, you may know of some other applications. I always go for the free ones because, you know, I'm cheap. Um, so there are you know, some applications here, like for instance, Pro Movie Recorder, Professional 4K Video Camera Control. It's a free download and it gives you, um, you know, shutter control, aperture control, ISO control. I might be speaking language you don't recognize yet. You'll know by the end of the semester what I'm talking about, but it gives you full manual override for your cameras, your phone's onboard camera which is gonna be really important in this class. So if you choose this as a device, you might, you might need PCAM or something to, uh, to control it. Um, the shooting assignments are uh, demonstrating uh, pulling focus, demonstrating composition. Um, I am also gonna have you shoot, uh, I think I have you shooting a short scene towards the very end, um, just a, a series of shots that would cut together or integrate together nicely uh, for a video. Um, and I th think that's it. There's like two or three shooting assignments where you actually have to create something. And then there's a couple of worksheets and some other stuff. So it's a variety of assignments at this point. Will we be doing any editing assignments like on maybe Adobe Premiere or anything like that? No, gosh, no. This is cinematography class. You guys have editing. Have you taken editing already? Yeah, I have taken editing and I'm into sound design after this. So, 
Okay. I'm just okay. curious to see if there's anything in with video and things like that. I, I don't have editing assignments for a couple of very pragmatic reasons. Okay. Very practical reasons. The first is uh, I'm not an editor. I can, I can edit and I know how to use Final Cut Pro and I know how to use Premiere. I'm learning DaVinci Resolve. Um, but I might not be the best guy for you to learn editing from. If you want to know about cinematic lighting on the largest scale possible, I'm your man. You want to learn about cinematic camera work? I'm your man because there's, there's a lot that I can offer you in terms of information and experience in those areas. Editing, I think, is better uh, given to you by somebody who maybe considers themselves an editor for real, professional editor even. You know, because then they're going to know the best practices. They're going to have little tricks and things. And their passion is strictly geared towards editing, where mine is not. Although I do shoot for the edit, we call it. Um, I do have the edit in mind when I'm shooting a commercial, for instance. And a lot of times I will insist on having the editor with me on a, on a commercial shoot. Uh, just so we can discuss the logistics of how images will lay together on a timeline. And will they cut nicely? Will they flow? If I do this, will it work with this? And, and so forth. I love to have the editor's input when I'm shooting like car commercials and things like that. Uh, but am I uh, the best teacher for the editing class? I don't know, probably not, right? So I don't wanna put that in my class when you can be better served in another that is strictly an editing class. Um, and the other reason is editing is a craft all in and of itself. There are guys out in LA that have union cards that say they are professional editors, right? My card said uh, professional set lighting, okay? Uh, and so if I'm, you know, shooting and, and lighting, uh, I have a union card that says I'm qualified to do that, right? Um, there's people that do that for a living and uh, that could be a class in and of itself. And so it, it would be, I'm going to say waste of time here for lack of a better phrase. Okay. I want to teach you just about camera and lighting technique here. And then your editing class is where you should get fed all of that really good uh, and beneficial information. Okay. So that's why I don't focus on it so much here. All right. I know it's necessary and it's a great thing to understand if you're a cinematographer, I would say critical. Okay, but I don't cover it in, in, in really either of my classes so much. Although cinematography too, when I talk to you about coverage and covering a scene and scene design, it has very much to do with the editing process and what the editors are gonna expect in terms of the content I provide them that they chop together and, and create a movie. So from that point of view, I, I do cover editing. If you could think about it as the other side of the conversation, right? I do approach editing and cinematography too, but here, in this forum, in this class, I'm trying to keep it as, as, as simple as possible because some of us are only here because it's a core required class and they got to get through it, right? And so I don't want to burden you with something that you really won't need down the line. I want to give you just the best stuff from here. And if you want more, come see me in cinematography too, and we'll get down and dirty with it, okay? Anybody else? Anyone else? Questions? Hi, how you doing? Hey. How's your day going? <laughs> uh, you know, pretty good now. It's, it's going better. How about you? Um, I'm, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot better. I was panicking at 9 a.m. because <laughs> I didn't see anything. Me too. Very, <laughs> very confused. I didn't want to email you. I didn't want anybody. I didn't want to be the guy to be like, oh, he doesn't know where he's supposed to be. Look at this guy over here. Not Man, I went to I went to school thinking that this was going to be an in person class at first. I, I thought it was an in person class everyone. too. <laughs> Me too. I, I'm out I'm here. here. <laughs> I, I was looking up everything I could possibly find last night. I know. Day. I'm, yeah, I I know. Was, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm proactive, right? I I was in the business for 30 years, so. A tech scout is very common for us before a movie starts. We go to the locations beforehand and we look at them and we say, oh, we're going to paint that wall or we're going to pull that wall out or we're going to, 
you know, we're going to add set decoration over here. We're going to do whatever. So I came to school last Friday and I tech scouted room 110 and I, I learned how to use the AV system because it's different than what's in this room. And I, I figured out how to integrate my laptop and I had this really great overhead device. I'm like, oh, this will be great. I can use this and demonstrations and stuff. And I totally got teched out on room 110 only to find out this morning that we're going to be online. So I was just as uh, caught by surprise as, as you folks might have been. And I, I apologize for that. We had some bad intel. Um, we just, we get through it, right? This is what we do. I mean, I was in the business for 30 years and some people can say, well, what was your job? And I tell them problem solving. You know, no, I mean, what did you do? Uh, I solved, I put out fires, really. Yeah, my craft was lighting or camera work, but it seems like that equates for maybe 10% of the job and the rest of it is, the we call it the oh my god factor you get to work and oh my god it's all changed it's different now something's happened it's raining when it wasn't supposed to be or we lost our permit for the location or the actors got the flu or you name it uh it's always something right and so uh this is what we do right we just roll with it and we figure out how to manage it and we get on with it as best we can right so uh those of you who made it to the in-person meeting i congratulate you because you are the uh, due diligent ones at this point you're the ones that you know understood the responsibility and accepted it and you're here so i applaud you for that i just want uh, to make sure it wasn't my fault no it wasn't that was my your only fault. mission <laughs> Was not your fault. Now, three weeks from now, might be your fault. But today, today everybody's off the hook. <laughs> okay. I want to make sure. <laughs> okay. Just All the right. one freebie. We only get a freebie. Well, this one and maybe one more, right? So All right. We'll Sounds see. good. We'll see how that goes, right? I, I really can't gig you for something that, you know, took us all by surprise. That would be completely unfair. Uh, and unrealist, unrealistic of me because I have certainly had my, my share of getting caught with my pants down, so to speak, uh, in, in my job in recent years. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll just go with it. We'll make the best out of it as we can. I'm, I'm sure just happy that great. this wasn't in person it. at the last moment, because I live in St. Cloud now. So oh, yeah. driving out <laughs> from St. Cloud at 8.55 to make a nine o'clock meeting is just not going to happen. Not going to happen. That's right. So, so we all got out of this uh, fairly cleanly. Um, anybody else have anything uh, outside of the purview of the intro? Uh, I have like a question, but I feel like it's more so just a camera question instead of like the course. Shoot. So as the more editor videographer is what I'm into for like video and editing, things like that. I'm looking into cameras from a professional. What would you recommend as a great start to a video camera? We're going to cover that in week three. Oh, awesome. Okay. Okay. So do you want to, yeah, I can wait. If it's going to be a whole like, thing about it, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to cover a, a bunch of different cameras. Um, who's that? What Clayton's showing? What was that? A Sony? What is that? It's the, uh, the Panasonic GH5. The Lumix. Oh yeah. Right on. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've got one of those myself. Love it. Love that camera. Um, there's lots of stuff out there. Here's what I'm learning about, about YouTube lately. Um, I have come to the, uh, the sobering realization that uh, YouTube is now uh, heavily driven by consumerism, okay? If you get a website and your whole website is based on the premise that you do equipment reviews, right? Um, what are you going to do? You're going to review the stuff that comes out as the manufacturers produce it, right? Well, that whole business model is predicated on the introduction of new devices that hit the market, right? So you're always going to be looking at the newest thing. Do I need the newest camera? Absolutely not. Is the best camera the newest camera? Absolutely not. Most of the times it probably is because they have uh, introduced a model that has dealt with a bug in software or uh, gives you a little bit better knob or a different color or takes a better set of lenses or something. Hopefully the new models that come out 
are improvements on the existing models and definite improvements over old ways of doing things. But does that mean that a camera that's five years old is not a really great camera that you could definitely shoot a movie with? Absolutely not. There are uh, cameras out there that will serve you well that may not be this year or last year's introduction. They might be the darling of five years ago, but they're still a damn good piece of equipment. And a lot of times you can get them at a good price. You get them at what I consider a more realistic price than they were introduced at. Uh, what I've noticed in my career is that anything that is associated with the film industry generally carries a higher retail price than it would in any other walk of life because people that work in the film industry have a habit of renting their equipment to production companies as a source of income. And the manufacturers know this and they take that into consideration when they uh, place a value on their gear. And so a camera that might or logically should only cost you a thousand might cost you 2000 uh, for that reason alone. Okay. Uh, there's also a certain amount of value that is assigned to brand um, which I don't think is a justifiable reason for jacking up the cost of a piece of gear, but there are some manufacturers who routinely ask more for their equipment than others. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh, in those cases, is it really important for you to have a camera that says, say, Sony on it as opposed to Panasonic? I don't think so, unless your client happens to be Sony, and then maybe you want to be shooting on a Sony camera. But does... Johnson and Johnson care if you shoot their baby powder commercial on a Sony camera or a Panasonic camera? Probably not. They're in fact, they're going to rely on you to tell them what camera would be the best camera to use. So I say the best camera is probably the one you are the most comfortable with. It's the one you can afford either to rent or to buy. Uh, it has the best specs you can get for your money. Um, and then you make up the difference with skill, okay? Um, my cinema cameras, uh, I don't have anything that came out uh, this year or last year. Uh, my biggest camera, the flagship of my personal package is a, 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 a Blackmagic uh, Ursa Mini 4.6K. Uh, not the G2, um, not, the, not the G1 Pro, just the... Uh, generation one with almost no buttons on the outside. And I thought that that would be a major drawback. And then I started using the camera. I teach with it for cinematography too. Uh, and I realized, you know what? I thought I wanted a bunch of buttons on the side of this camera that I could access because I was used to using Panasonic video cameras and Sony video cameras that have nightmare menu systems to navigate when you want to make certain camera changes and adjustments on the fly. And so I thought, man, I'd rather just have all my buttons on the outside of the camera. And then I realized, yeah, but in handheld mode, when the camera's right up here banging against the side of my face and I'm running around with it and I'm hitting buttons by accident that I never intended to, now I don't want buttons on the outside of the camera. And the Blackmagic camera has a really wonderful touch interface on the screen, the flip out LCD screen, which I find a very, very luxurious and very cathartic process. I, I like that. Just tap and slide and adjust the camera with a simple touch of my finger on that little monitor. And then I look at the image and I see the adjustments in real time. And I say to myself, you know what, that fits my vibe personally, uh, and, and perfectly. Uh, and so, you know what, I, I don't feel the need to upgrade to a G2 camera whatsoever. It's still 4.6K. It still shoots raw video. It still shoots an amazing looking image. And it was introduced in uh, December of 2017. So could I buy this year's camera? I don't know that I would. Why should I spend $6,000 for something I can get for three or two, right? That's just how I am now because I was an owner operator in Hollywood for a long time and I know how much equipment can cost. All right. My truck with just my lighting in it was, was worth $280,000. Okay. And that was a big investment and it, it meant maintenance and upkeep and, and buying new versions of the same gear when the old stuff wore out or got broken or got missing, stolen or lost, you know, it's a big investment, you know, so anywhere that you can save money, uh, you know, I'm all about that now. You know, if I can get 
you know, a really good piece of gear for $500, why would I spend 2000? Okay. There's just no reason for it. And yeah, can I write the $2,000 piece of gear off of my income taxes? Yep, I sure can. I can also write the $500 gear off of my taxes. But if I buy one thing at $2,000, uh, that's what I got. If I buy four things at $500, I've spent the same two grand, but now I have a lens and a wireless uh, a uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, transceiver. I've got a lavalier microphone and something else for five bills that I needed as well, because you need more than just a camera. You need a camera and lenses and filters and video equipment and monitors and hoods and mat boxes and tripods. And it, there's no end to it, what you need in terms of equipment to fortify yourself when you're making a movie for real. Uh, so anywhere you can save a nickel, absolutely do it. So if that, you know, I'm taking you the long way around the block in terms of the best camera to buy, but my point is there's a lot of things to consider. You have to start qualifying your choices and qualify them based on criteria. How much can I afford, whether to buy or to rent? What features do I need? What job am I doing? Because this, the video or the, I'm going to call it film, you know, take liberties with the, with the term when you're making a film you got a lot of things to consider certain types of shots that you want certain types of action that you're gonna that you're gonna do big heavy camera might not be good on a movie that has a lot of handheld prescribed shots in it and a lot of action you might want something smaller and lighter so you might like a really big studio camera for one kind of movie and a really small lightweight camera for another type of movie right and so you have to qualify every choice that you make based on what's being asked of you, okay? And, and, and this is how you should approach all of this, you know? Um, what am I, what's the job at hand? What am I responsible for? What am I being asked to do? What are the factors that I can control? And then I will control them based on my mastery of skill sets. That's the whole thing. That's, that's the cinematography in a nutshell. OK, but week three, I think it is uh, we will talk about specific types of cameras and which ones are good, good, good ideas for uh, for this class and for entry level uh, work in the industry. Anybody else have a question like that? That was a good one. All right. Who is this guy? Who am I? I am your professor. My name is Michael Walsh. I was in the industry for a good long time. Um, I actually dropped out of film school when I was probably younger than most of you I can see on the screen. Uh, I was about 20 when I got into the industry. Um, really green, really naive, um, really young and inexperienced and no contacts in the industry either. So my dad wasn't in it, my brother wasn't in it, you know, my uncle wasn't in it, my grandpa wasn't in it, just me. It was what I wanted for me. And so uh, I got into the business and I was very, very lucky, okay? Uh, and I stayed in for, for a long time. Um, if you wanna know what I did, um, do you guys know what IMDB is, Internet Movie Database? Right, so you can go to IMDB. Here's my link right here. It's embedded in web courses for you. Uh, you can go and you can look at my, my resume, okay? Uh, such that it is on IMDB. Now, the thing about IMDB is there's no commercials. There's no music videos. Um, once upon a time, there wasn't student films and short films and festival submissions either. It was only if it was verifiable having been on television or been in the theaters or having limited theatrical release or some kind of high profile internal video production. And that was it. That was all that was on IMDb. Now there's a little bit, they're more um, open with their uh, submission allowances. Uh, and so a lot of folks will have, you know, IMDb's that have, you know, a lot of short films on them and things that you may have never uh, heard of before. My IMDB goes back to 19, uh, I think 1989, 1990. Um, and it's got, you know, everything that I did at the studio level uh, for th through, I think it stops at 2012, I think. Um, 
So none of my commercials, none of my music videos, none of that stuff is going to be on there. Um, and a lot of that stuff, I don't even re remember half of it. I saw a music video the other day and I said, that's, I know that song from somewhere. I had done the music video and I totally forgot about it. It was a Snow Patrol uh, uh, music video I saw on, uh, I think it was YouTube or something. And I was like, yeah, that tune's familiar. Wait, I've heard that song, but wait a minute. I know those guys. What is that? Snow Patrol. And I'm like, I did that video back in, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of funny how, how that will happen. Um, but this will show you who I am and what I'm about. So uh, I am from the business. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you this uh, about me. Um, I started on the East coast. I was born in Rochester, New York. Um, I worked for a, um, a photo studio. Uh, they hired me when I was still a, a junior in high school. I hadn't even graduated yet. And uh, they hired me and I shot um, real estate photos and stuff like that for them. I assisted them on weddings and we did product photography and lots of cool stuff. And uh, I thought that was my life path. I thought that was what I was going to do. And gr being born in Rochester, New York, that that was kind of what a lot of people would do there their career somehow revolved around Kodak and film and, and, you know, whether you worked at the manufacturing plant and just, you know, punched out film canisters or drove a truck, a delivery truck for Kodak lab or what, you know, almost everybody in Rochester was doing, you know, something for Kodak back in those days. And I just thought that was going to be what, you know, my life had in store for me. Um, and then I, I moved uh, down here uh, in the, mid 80s and uh, there was a film industry burgeoning down here and I used to uh, I had a great uh, one of my first mentors was the owner of the studio I worked for and uh, his name was Garth and, and when we would have coffee breaks and slow days we would sit up in the studio uh, and he would tell me stories about the movie industry and and what it was like because he had done a little bit of that in his youth and he used to talk to me about cameras and movie cameras and camera assistants and stuff. And, and I was always intrigued by it, but it wasn't really our mainstay. It wasn't what we were doing at that studio at the time. It was all still work and illustration work. So uh, it was just sort of interesting conversation to have. But when I realized that there was a burgeoning industry in Florida, uh, I had family down here. So I moved down to Florida and I kind of crossed over. Um, and at that time too, I, I was uh, I was in uh, film school and uh, I dropped out. I dropped out of film school and I went to work in the industry uh, and I got sort of sucked up into the machine and, and it just one thing led to another. And, you know, many, many years of uh, water passed under the bridge. Uh, I worked all over the country uh, in many parts of the world and I ended up in California for the last I don't know, 12 years of my career, more or less. Um, and uh, it was a lot, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of got hurt on the job. And so I had to have some surgeries and stuff. And I was in rehab for like a year and a half. And uh, in that amount of time, you know, things can change for you, you know, you lose touch with people, you, your, your focus changes, your, you know, your life changes in, in dramatic ways. And I kind of realized that it was, t I needed to retire because my body was not up to the task anymore. And so I took up teaching. And then one of the first things I did is I went back and I finished my college degree. So um, anybody who comes to me now and says, well, Professor Walsh, you dropped out. Why shouldn't I drop out and just get busy right now? And the answer is because you'll finish it at some point. You know, you'll either finish it now or you'll come back and finish it later, but you'll finish it eventually because you realize that uh, it's a good idea. Um, if you ever have to end up doing something other than the film industry, you'll have your education and your degree to fall back on. Now, for me as a teacher, I got to have degrees. I can't come in as Joe Blow off the street uh, and teach you guys how to make movies. Not in Orlando. I can do that in Los Angeles because my film resume speaks to my experience, right? But in Orlando, you know, you don't know me from Joe Sixpack. So 
I need to have bona fides that, you know, the state of Florida can verify and say, yeah, this guy's qualified to teach. Uh, so I got my degree and I got my master's degree. So I have, a, I, have a, uh, I have an undergrad degree ultimately in writing and rhetoric and a master's of fine arts in screenwriting, right? Um, and I have 30 years of film production experience, uh, union membership and Los Angeles film experience. So um, that, keep that in mind when you read my IMDB and that'll inform you of who you're dealing with, okay? So I, what I hope you'll understand is um, that my input is in your best interest and, I, and I'm always concerned that I give you the best possible advice and information that I can give you, okay? And it is predicated on my life experience, on my professional experience, and on my research, which I continue to do to this day. So believe you me, I spend a lot of time on the internet reading articles, writing articles, uh, vetting YouTube videos, commenting sometimes to the dismay of some people who have have uh, felt my criticisms on YouTube, um, but it's all in the spirit of vetting information and making sure that the resources that you have available to you are good, reliable, actionable, right? So uh, you might ask me, you know, what's the best lens to use? And now I've got to distill down all kinds of experience to try and give you a straight answer. Right. And I can give you that answer based on a lot of things. Well, what was the best lens you ever worked with? Well, that's easy, like a Sumalux. OK, but I'm not going to tell you to run out and buy a twenty six thousand dollar cinema prime. That's not <laughs> actionable information for you. All right. So I'm going to give you a different kind of an answer. And that answer, if you were to ask me that answer three different times in your career now, five years from now and 15 years from now, the answer would be different. Probably. Maybe. Okay, so when you when you ask me when you guys ask me a question, which is why I hope that you will. Okay, I'm going to give you an answer based on what I know, right? Not about what I read in a book and I regurgitated for your pleasure, right? I'm not a, I'm not that guy. Okay, and I'll probably give you the practical answer and not necessarily the glamorous answer or the sexy answer, right? I'll give you the answer that I think will serve you the best in your capacity right now, okay? Um, so that's what I hope I'm bringing to the table, which is why I hope that you'll ask me questions. Um, what I try to be as a teacher is the guy that I never had access to when I was your age. Okay, I didn't get my mentors in the film industry until I got out there and went to work. That was how I met them and that's, that's how I learned. And, and then the unions, of course, were instrumental in shepherding along my career and my job experience and, and my knowledge and skill sets that I have today. Okay, so all of those things are super important. Um, so I wanna be a resource for you, I think is what I'm trying to say. Okay, don't just think of me as a teacher who's standing up. Well, we're not standing in front of you. We're online now, but I'm not the guy that's just sort of spouting information out of a syllabus or out of a textbook at you. Okay, uh, chances are I've probably already done it, screwed it up, broken it, bled over it, used it, tried it, tested it, or at the very least vetted it for somebody else's information. Okay. So use me, use me, okay? I hope that you will, because there's a lot to face when you get out into the business world. Uh, and the better prepared you can be, the more serviceable your career will be to you. In the course of this class, I don't know if you can see this right here, the Cook Optics logo. Uh, Cook Optics is a lens manufacturer. They're based in England. Uh, and recently they started Cook Optics TV and uh, I really like their videos. So I use them a lot in my presentations and I sometimes will give you videos to look at from Cook Optics. You go to the website or I'll give you a link. Um, they, they make fantastic lenses, fantastic cinema lenses. 
Uh, in fact, they're Roger Deakins' favorite, the, the cinematographer I asked you to tell me about for your um, financial aid assignment. Uh, his favorite lenses are Cook uh, S4s. Um, but I called, I, I, I sent them an email and I said, hey guys, uh, I teach now um, and I, like, I really like your videos and I want to use them in my classes and show my students and have them you know, access your site and everything. And they sent me a wonderful letter, you know, abs you know, thanking me, thanking you guys for subscribing to Cook Optics and, and gave us their blessing to use their content in, in whatever way uh, uh, I see fit. So um, I'm going to use a lot of their videos uh, wherever possible in my presentations. And I do it for a couple of reasons. With as much as I've been uh, lucky to do in my career, I don't know everything. And, so, and sometimes it's better to know more than one point of view on something, right? There's always more than one way to skin a cat. So rather than you guys only hearing my voice all the time and what I think about things and what my point of view of the world is, I'm going to introduce other sources of information for you that I have per personally vetted and reached out to these people and said, hey, I want to use your stuff. Is it okay? and give you another voice to hear other than mine, okay? And this is one of those that you'll see a lot, the Cook Optics uh, videos. Uh, this is a little bit about the, the videos. Um, and then I, here's a few for you to look at already for, uh, for week one, okay? They're not all Cook Optics videos, but these are, this is where you'll find your videos uh, embedded into the web courses, like this is section 1.1 introduction. Here they are embedded. Sometimes it might just be a link with a YouTube uh, thumbnail uh, and it'll take you out of web courses to YouTube and then link you back. Um, but this is where I'll put the videos that I feel like you need to have at your access to go back and watch again or study uh, in terms of quizzes or tests, okay? So they'll be in uh, web courses for you. Uh, I'll also give you um, either within the context of a section page, or I'll give it maybe its own page, uh, downloadable PDF. So here's a crew breakdown PDF for week one for, uh, you'll probably find it most useful when, when I talk about crew positions and stuff. It's a document you can download and it's gonna talk to you about um, crew positions. Um, here's your reading assignment, okay? The, your first reading assignment, Introduction to Cinematography, chapter one, page one through 17 titled The Big Picture, okay? That's your first reading assignment. So this is kind of how Web Courses is gonna be laid out and structured for you so that uh, you can access all the information quickly and easily. And um, there might be supplementary information here for you to check out or to read. Now, this is how I had intended to structure the, uh, the lectures this semester, thinking that we were in room 110 there was going to be a face-to-face -face experience and then uh, I also left in all of the lectures from last semester that I did with my students in the online curriculum. So there are already lectures for every class this semester. Just remember that these are from the spring of 2021. So it was my class at that point in time. What I'll do is I'll leave these up and then I'll put these Zooms on YouTube as well. And I'll give you another link right beside it or right below it. So this link is from January 11th of this year. Below it next, next week, or maybe by the end of this week, you'll see a link from June 28th, 2021, and then another thumbnail. And that'll be the discussion from today. All right, so there's stuff already up there information is already up there. Um, all of the videos, I, th I think I open them as I open the topics to you, all right, so that you're not inundated at the very beginning with videos. But then they'll stay open until the end of the semester, okay? So you can go back anytime you want and reaccess that information, whether to uh, study for a test or for your own enrichment or to help you maybe uh, power through something that you were having trouble with. Uh, these videos will remain open until uh, the 4th of August, and then your final is on the 5th of August. So uh, so everything closes down at midnight on the 4th, and then on the 5th, your final opens, and that's the end of the semester, okay? 
what I'll do for you guys now, I'll go back to my old uh, assignment structure, which is, you see down here where it says points, none, submitting nothing. Can you see that right here? It's going to change. It's, it's still going to say points, none, uh, but it's going to say submit uh, a text or a document. Okay. And what it'll have, what'll happen is uh, instead of just seeing this, you'll see this and you'll have, um, there should be a text box on your version of this page in the student view uh, where you can write a text entry. And if you haven't been to the live session, you'll just enter in the text box. Um, I've, I watched, I've, I've, I've watched the video or I've seen the video. Um, this video is uh, section 1.1 introduction and it covers A, B, C, okay? Just put that in the text box and submit it, okay? And if you have been to the live session, what I'm gonna do is generate the Zoom uh, report when this meeting closes. And I'm gonna go into the attendance roster for this class and I'm gonna tick all the boxes by everybody who was present here today. If, if this ends up being a three hour Zoom lecture, God forbid for today, but if it does, um, if you were here for at least two thirds of that, I'm gonna give you credit for being here in the live session. If you show up for five to 15 minutes or even for a half an hour, just to you know, get your name on the, on the report uh, and that's it, uh, you're not gonna get credit for the live lecture. At that point, what you'll be responsible for is going and watching the recorded version and then do the little text box submission for me. And when I know you've seen the lecture, uh, that's when you get an attendance uh, credit for that lecture, okay? And that's how it works. There will be 12 of these, okay? So you'll have uh, an attendance grade based on these lectures, having come to the live or viewed them as a recorded session. Okay, that's how you'll get your attendance grade. Uh, everything else is say an actual submission, an assignment submission, okay? Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, this is what we'll talk about. We'll talk about this some more on uh, Wednesday. Uh, these are four individuals that I have selected. Um, there are lots of outstanding cinematographers in the American Society of Cinematographers. Okay, I've chosen four to sort of as a conversation starter. Uh, I've given you their websites, their links to YouTube video, like probably their production reel or something, uh, demonstrating their work. Uh, told you a little bit about them up here, a little bit of blurb, okay? Um, and these are four cinematographers that I think are exemplary uh, in their field. So we've got uh, Roger Deakins, uh, we have Emmanuel Lubetsky, we have uh, Christopher Doyle, and Seamus McGarvey. Okay, uh, these are by any means, these are not the four best, although I, you know, arguably they are among the very best cinematographers. Um, there are many, many, many dozens of names on the active roster of ASC. So to pick four out of that volume of individuals that are out there creating and collaborating is, is a really hard thing to do. It would be a hard choice for me to pick the best cinematographer. I don't, I don't know if I could or would even want to try. Um, but these are four uh, benchmarks that I think you should at least know about these folks and what they're doing, how they go about their uh, profession. Uh, because they're good role models and we need role models, uh, especially in, in now uh, where there are so many voices trying to be heard and trying to contribute in the industry. Sometimes it can be uh, really, really difficult to um, filter out the minutia and, and get to the real good quality uh, information. These folks right here, I consider to be exemplary uh, demonstrations of cinematographers. 
Okay, here's a section two lecture. So I've shown you basically the structure of web courses. This is kind of how it works. And so your modules page is gonna look like so. So here's your getting started menu. Everything's been published. It's already up there. Um, the assignments will open on the weeks that they are released to you and they'll close sometime after the fact. Um, the due dates are always posted here. Um, there's also a course calendar that will show you how it breaks down. I'm going to do two sections a week since it's a six week session and we're Monday, Wednesday. So I'm doing uh, intro and section one uh, today. Tuesday we'll do uh, role models. Or, I'm sorry, Wednesday we'll do role models. Next week on Monday we'll do uh, camera department positions and, and responsibilities. And on Wednesday we'll do uh we'll talk about camera media on wednesday right we're going to move pretty quick uh because the summer sessions are always you know short six weeks as opposed to 16 weeks so we've got to cram 16 weeks of practical coursework into six so this is another reason why there's so much information for you on web courses so that you can keep track of everything access everything at any time you need to access it okay uh, and don't just rely on these live sessions uh, to get your feedback okay uh, you can access any of this stuff at this point anytime you need to if you look uh, everything's been published okay so you shouldn't have trouble opening any of this um, the only things that you won't maybe be able to open might be an assignment that's not due right away uh, this one is actually not published because I'm not offering an extra credit uh, at this time. Uh, if the situation calls for it, uh, when we get closer to section 1.7, I may open that up and offer it to folks that are struggling. Um, but in my experience, uh, I haven't had very many people uh, fail my cinematography one class. Okay. Now, if you come on day one and then you don't show up for the rest of the semester yeah you're not going to pass right but if you come every week if you go to the lectures if you do the assignments and you keep up with the homework and the reading uh you're going to be fine you're going to be okay right um i think i might have had three people fail in the spring uh, and it was because like i said they showed up for like the first couple of weeks and then they went mia and never never came back that person's going to fail and there's nothing that I can do to help that person, right? You got to put your work in. But if you do what's asked of you here, which is pretty simple, uh, you know, I don't think I had anybody below a 70 in the spring and I, most people were in the mid to high 80s and, and, and A's, right? So um, I think you'll be okay even, even given the short period of time that we're going to be together here this uh, this summer. Um, and part of it, I think, is because everything is here for you. So let's just jump ahead, for instance, just uh, for pure demonstration sake, let's go to let's go to section 1.6, which will be week, uh, the end of week three, I think. Uh, if you go to lens work, right, uh, section 1.6. Okay, so here is an introduction to the topic. Here's lenses. Here's information. The same information will be in the lecture. All right, it's restated here so that you can go back and study it anytime you need to, right? Then here's a recorded lecture from the lenses section from the spring. Watch that. When we get to this section, you'll have my uh, current lecture alongside it, okay? Then here are the videos that I think from the lecture are the most important for you to need to resource back to. Here they are, boom, videos, right? Next page. Here are all the downloadable PDFs relevant to the lecture or the reading assignments. Okay, here is a new textbook for you, Anatomy of a Storyboard. Boom. Camera Assistance Manual. Boom. Panasonic FZ1000 Users Manual, the camera you're going to check out for your shooting assignment. Here's the instruction manual for it. Uh, here is the instructions on how to use the UCF checkout uh, system for uh, borrowing gear from UCF to do your projects. Here's your reading assignment. This is the book you'll be reading from. 
this is the title this is the chapter that your assignment is chapter four pages 221 to 231 so uh with that information go to your bookshelf open the pdf for the uh camera assistance manual and read pages 221 to 231 okay here's your shooting assignment for uh, section 1.6 here are all the instructions on how to approach a shooting assignment Okay. Here are the forms that you're going to see on the Zeus website for UCF, how to check out gear, right? Step by step. Here's the camera you're going to check out if you check out the gear. Uh, here's some other uh, links to information you might want to know or hints. Here is the assignment now. This is what you're going to do. You're going to create something, a shooting assignment. You'll produce four images and one video clip. These are thumbnails of some of the stuff that I want, the types of shots I want to see in your, in your video or in your, in your images, okay? And here's how you're going to submit it, okay? And then here's your due date. And then here's a look at the rubric that I'm going to use to grade your assignment, okay? It's all here, okay? It's all here. You could conceivably do this assignment right now if you needed to. All the information you need is here. Okay, um, and then let me see if there's anything else. Okay, then we jump to section 1.7 and it starts all over again. So this is how I've structured the class for you online. So, and then if this, this and the live sessions aren't enough, please reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm, I think I'm pretty good at responding back. I try to respond back as soon as I possibly can. All right, so if you send me an email and you're in trouble and you really need help, or further explanation on a topic, uh, let me know. But what you can do for me to shorten the process is simple. S tell me what you're stuck on. Uh, let's schedule a meeting. So let me know when you're available to take a meeting with me and we'll do a Zoom session, all right? So I'm gonna need to know what you're stuck on, when you'll be available to talk about it, give me some options if possible, uh, and then um, it's going to be Zoom, so we don't need to arrange a place, and, and, but, but we will have to decide on a time. Then I'll get back to you. This time works for me on, on this day of the choices of the options you've given me. Uh, can I book that? And then you just respond back, yes, and I'll put it in my calendar, and I'll create a Zoom uh, meeting or a phone meeting. Uh, for you and I on that specific day, all right? Some students send me an email and say, I really don't understand the homework assignment. Well, you know what? Uh, can you be more specific? What are you stuck on? Where are you at in the assignment? Have you started it yet? Are you all the way through it, halfway through it? Uh, and then when are you available? Days and times and let's make a meeting, okay? Um, but you know, Nebula's comments are going to protract this whole back and forth and that and, and then we may lose time as a result of it. OK, so be real considerate of. When you ask for something, be articulate so that I can be effective when offering you solutions. OK, um, but so that's it. So that's how the course is structured. Um, I don't want to get uh, really any further into it today because of the disjointed way in which we have sort of fallen together this afternoon. Um, but I, you know, I will open it up to more questions. Um, otherwise, I'm sort of hesitant to dive into anything else today. I don't know. Let's just have a look really quick. I think uh, if you check out my introduction lecture that's posted up there right now on YouTube, uh, it may fill in some cracks that I have maybe missed this, this morning. Um, what you could do is get a, get a jump on Wednesday uh, by looking at section 1.2 and 1.3, okay? Um, and this should help. Um, certainly 1.2 check that out. 1.3 uh, we'll talk about on Wednesday, 1.3 and 1.4. Um, this is who's in the camera department and what they're doing, okay? That's the conversation for Wednesday. So really check this out 
at some point between now and Wednesday. And you'll be, I think you'll be up to, up to snuff on everything uh, so far. I'm gonna do two sections per day, four sections per week to get through uh, 13 sections by the end of the summer, okay? Any, anybody have any confusion with that or any questions about that? Does it all make sense? It does. Okay. Um, does anybody anticipate dropping the course for now? Um, if you are, you remember Friday is your deadline for dealing with that. Okay. Don't forget you have a financial aid assignment for Friday as well. My is showing that some of this stuff is locked until three o'clock today. Really? That should not be the case. Let's see. Locked until three. In here. Really? The financial, Mine's showing the financial that too. assignment, um, the, the video lecture. Hmm. Let's see. I think I can go to... Let's see, due date changer. Let's see. We'll look at this wholesale and see if there's anything I can do about it. Uh, financial aid assignment due at, available from, ah, 3 p.m. Look at that. Here, I can change that right now. Uh, let's make that um, 11 a.m. uh what else did we say uh oh yeah 3 p.m look at that that's odd hmm. okay i thought it was just me it is just you john <laughs> figures i'm always late for me <laughs> 3 p.m i wonder why it's doing that that's odd because i certainly didn't punch in why would i punch in 3 p.m that doesn't make Sense. Yeah, thank you, John, for pointing that out because I was a little confused about it too. It might have been when my class started in the spring and it reverted back to that for some reason. Okay. Here, these are all 9 a.m. Oh, it looks like it might have been just the section one and two. That's good. Everything else seems to be 9 a.m. except this one. Okay. Um, so now let me apply that. And it should be, you know, moments away at that point from updating on your, you'll have to refresh your browser and then it should be good to go. There we go. Okay, so give that a couple of minutes and then uh, hit your refresh and you guys should be okay. Uh, if that problem comes up again, uh, just shoot me an email, let me know and I'll get on it as soon as I can. I'll tell you this about web courses. Um, I've worked on a couple of different learning management systems. I think web courses is the best in terms of the amount of control that I have in terms of designing a class and doing things. Uh, not everything is possible. There are certain things that web courses can't do. Uh, what I have noticed though, unfortunately, is with all of that capability comes an inherent glitchiness. Um, case in point, my due dates changed arbitrarily back to last semester. I don't know why, uh, it just happened. Uh, occasionally that will happen in the web courses universe. And when it does, don't be alarmed, just get on the horn with me as soon as possible. Let me know that a problem exists so I can get on it and get it solved, okay? Sometimes I have to call IT uh, or the web courses technical staff uh, to fix something. Um, and that, may, that sometimes will uh, delay uh, the solution from being implemented. But so the quicker you can let me know uh, there's a problem, uh, the sooner I can solve it for you, okay? Um, I started responding to your emails here this morning about our meeting. 
Uh, and then I realized that that was not an effective use of my time. Um, so I stopped responding. Uh, I'm going to take for granted that each of you who emailed me has now shown up in class. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I won't bother responding here. Um, if I don't respond to you, if you, if you have asked me something beyond that in these emails, just shoot me another email and I will um, get on that as soon as I can. Okay. Um, but it looks like everything here was about the location for the first day. So uh, I think we've all sort of figured out what's happening by now. Um, is there anything else that I can offer you, explain to you uh, this morning? Uh, I'm compelled at this point to let you guys go um, because I feel like I've sort of taken this as far as I can take it. Uh, yes. Um, so Grace pointed out in the chat that the general discussion board uh, is locked. It says it's been locked um, since April 21st. Oh my gosh. Where is it? This one here, general discussion. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, see if it'll let me edit and see what's going on in here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the <laughs> page you just left was the financial aid. I think it also said that it was closed until 3 p.m. But okay. That's I thought I just changed that in the due date changer. Let's see here. That that was just updated because I, I just okay. completed the financial aid. Okay, good, good. So it might be that you need to just refresh, uh, but I'm gonna do this manually right here to make sure that it's um it's working. Available as of now until August 4th at midnight. So that should be good. Let's see what the financial aid says now. It doesn't give me the time here, uh, only when it closes. Oh no, 11 a.m. here, it, it clicked over. Okay, so hopefully this is all working now. Yeah, the financial aid is working now. I was able to submit mine. Okay, the great. The session board is also um, up now. That was quick. Okay, web course yeah. is good today. All right, good. Well then, uh, if you spot something, let me know. Uh, if there's if there are no other issues or questions to raise at this time, uh, I'll treat this like a union meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I mean, you're in charge. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, our, this is our time. I don't want to become the dictator here. Yeah. Uh, if I have um, to, I will, because at the end of the day, the job has to be done, but this is our time. So yeah. I will ask you for your input and your feedback. It's important that you have a sense of, uh, you know, control in this situation, right? I want to create in you each a creative individual with a keen sense of what you can control and what you can't and, that, and, and when, right? So that becomes part of your approach to your job, whatever it is when you get in the industry, okay? Uh, I do have one quick question. Yes, go ahead. Um, on the, uh, the video lectures, um, was I corrected assuming if for some reason we can't make it to a specific live meeting that we can watch a recording of it uh, later in the day or, or the next day or something and still get credit for seeing it? Yes, yes. And what we'll do is uh, I will restore the um, I will restore the text message feedback option in the assignment. I left it as an assignment with no points and and no um, no submission requirements. Um, what I'll do is I'll reinstate the submission requirements as a text entry or a document. So, for instance, if for some reason you're on a device that has to send me a document like a, a text note or a Word document from another computer, let's say, uh, you'll be able to submit uh, that you've seen the, um, the lecture. But all you really have to do is in the text box say, I've, I've seen the video, you know, 
maybe date and time and and abc it was about this this and this okay <laughs> then i know that you actually watched it and i will go into the attendance roster and give you credit for that lecture okay okay because i'm going to miss wednesday's class and so i wanted to make sure i could still see something so absolutely right. at the very least last semester's video will be up for you for section 1.3 Okay. okay. And 1.4. Okay. Now I'm going to caution you. Uh, second 1.4 is where I talk about digital recording media and it's a little detail intensive. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me after you've seen that video lecture. There's also a worksheet homework assignment for section 1.4 and you'll be expected to fill it in based on the tutorials from the lecture. So you may need some help with that. Uh, if you do, it's not unusual. Um, so reach out to me as soon as you have a question and, and we'll get it solved. Okay. Uh, I, I got two questions about the um, missing class and watching the video. Um, watching it and telling you what we uh, that we saw it, saying it's the, uh, the message, then the note that says that we saw it. Uh, do we get full credit for yep. attendance for that? Yep. And my second one is, so you could just do that instead of coming at nine from nine to 1245, or is it still? You could, and there are, and there are some who are gonna play it that way, okay? Uh, but I would like to think that in exchange for your time, because if we were face to face, you'd have to come to class, right? So right. In, exchange, in exchange for your time, hopefully this thing that we're doing is going to offer you something a little bit more than you could have got on your own by just watching a recorded video. Namely, you've asked me now about four or five questions in this session already. And I hope that, you know, A, I answered your questions to your satisfaction. And B, it gave you a better sense of confidence about this class or about what we're covering that you have access to me one-to-one -one if you need it, okay? So I think coming to the lectures is to your benefit, but you plan- Oh, I plan on good. coming. I just wanted to make sure I know, I understand the guidelines. No, that's a good question. And for the other 40 people who didn't bother to come to the lecture today, uh, you've answered a question that pertains to them directly. Uh, which is if you're not going to come to the live sessions, you can play it that way. But I think you stand to gain if you if you take the time out of your busy schedule to come to the class that you enrolled in, because that's kind of the assumption. If we were in face to face mode, you'd be coming to the classroom. Right. Um, you can't really you can't get credit if you don't show up. But in the case of an online session, um, I have to afford you the opportunity to watch it uh, as a pre-recorded option at your leisure uh, for things like conflicting work schedules or hospitalizations or family emergencies or, you know, the random life problem. You know, if you were coming to campus and you ran out of gas and you missed a class, that's something that is not, you know, entirely your fault or it's an accident, an unintended consequence. And so I feel obliged to give you an option that will you know ease the suffering of whatever complication you're already dealing with i don't want to i don't want to heap on top of what you might already have working against you uh, but there are some folks that try to skate by doing the bare minimum and if that's the case uh it becomes evident to me who those individuals are in the course of a semester and then you know what sometimes it comes down to just basic consideration you know uh, you might, you know, if, if, you know, some individuals, they never come to class, they, they don't turn their homework in, or they always turn it in late. And then at the end of the semester, they want to know, oh my gosh, I, I don't have a good grade and I'm not going to get the, the B plus that I was expecting. Is there anything that I can do? And, and in the 11th hour, I usually say, well, you know what? No, there really isn't. You know, I, I, you know, I'm looking at your file and I don't see where you've really uh, put forth an honest effort here. And so in the 11th hour, I'm going to say, no, there's not. You're going to have to take the class over again. Or I might say, you know what? You've been to every lecture. You've done everything that I asked you to do. You've always submitted your work on time. 
uh, let's, let, you know, I'm going to go the extra mile, right? And I don't, I, I don't feel that that is inappropriate at, at that point in time. If, if you're working and you're showing me that you're engaged and you're earnest about your education, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you. That's what I'm here to do. Okay. I hope you believe that. Thank you. Yes, sir. And one other question on video attendance, if I may. Uh -huh. uh, on the announcements there, it shows uh, every two weeks, Monday, Wednesday, every other week. Is that correct? Uh, it should be Monday, Wednesday, every week for the next six weeks. Okay. Because that's not what the, the first announcement showed. It's got announcement uh, as in yeah. this one announcements. Yes. Uh, on that, on that, the, the, I guess the second one from the top, it There's shows one. June 28th and 30th, and then not again until July 12 and 14th. No. Um, is it the uh, link for the live sessions? Now just um, now just click on the, the yeah the next one down. The second one or the first one? The second one. The second announcement. Which is... Oh, this one is. Uh, I think I. This one is the most recent one. So I think this one is. Um, you I, see you, I, my confusion. Oh yeah. Oh, that's odd. Why did it do that? Hmm. Well, did you use this link or the link from the first message to get to me? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure which one I did. Because one of the links, I, I think I, I did the link that was in the email. Work. Yeah, one of these didn't work for me this morning, so I put up the second link. So now it's a question of which link you guys are using. Uh, to be honest, I think I actually did it with uh, the email that you sent which is this right here. So let me see if this is the same as the other one, VY9PT09. Um, I discovered that that is also the same um, on the Zoom tab. Well, say that again? So on the Zoom tab, how it says um, 28th, 30th, and then it goes straight to the 12th and the 14th. Hmm, that's interesting. 12th and 14th. Yeah, it sure does. Um, I wonder, it, well, let's see. If we look at the calendar, the, um, the course has you guys scheduled today. Yeah, it does. It does every other week on that one, too. On the calendar, at least on my calendar. May. June, here we go, today and Wednesday, and then yeah, you should, oh, well, this day, they're not observing campus classes, so I'm, I'm wondering since the Zoom tab, but you should have a seventh here. That's odd. There should at least be one for the seventh. Well, we will have a Zoom meeting, and let me, I'll see if I can rectify that in the interim, but I think regardless, it's the same link no matter what. So if you respond to that link, even though it says there's not a session planned, you should still be able to attend. Okay, but it is and every I'll, Monday. Okay. Yeah, it's every Monday and Wednesday, yeah. Okay, so, so I'm glad I, I, because I, I thought that there was only Zoom classes every other week, so. No, every week, every week. But in, in the case of July 5th, here's how we're going to play it. Uh, since it's the observable holiday on that Monday, we won't have a live session, um, but you'll have the recorded session anyway that you can look at. Okay. So that because if the campus is not coming in for the holiday, I can't ask you to report to a Zoom session on the same day. Um, right. You know, okay. Uh, but there is a recorded lecture on there that you can watch. Say you could watch it on Tuesday um, and make it up then. You know, uh, I usually give you a few days to watch those sessions. Like um, 
if it's a Monday or Tuesday session, the due date is usually Friday to watch it to get credit. So not only do you get credit for watching it, but you've got more time to watch it than, you know, reporting to a specific live session. Okay. So you'll be, it'll be manageable. I, I, I assure you. Um, but I'll see if I can figure out what that problem is, where that stems from and, and, and nip it in the bud for us. But we're here right now. We're here right now. No, that's Wednesday. Okay. That's the next up. That's why. I joined the Zoom from that pet from that tab. So from this tab, okay. Yes. Good. Good. But if you look at the next date on the next meeting, it says not until July twelfth. Right. There should be one in between that says uh, July seventh, Wednesday, July seventh. Yeah. So if I have to, I'll make a separate link for a July seventh meeting if I have to. Uh, okay. Because depending on you know the proximity of that date, I notice that sometimes it lets me change stuff and sometimes it doesn't. So I'll see what I can do about that. If I have to, I'll make a fresh link just for the seventh. Everything else looks okay though. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, but look at look at those dates though, boss. I was going to ask you about the um, past the August 9th dates since yeah, I thought last day of classes was August 4th. Huh. Yeah. Son of a gun. I may have to redo this whole thing. I might have to just erase this whole thing and create a new one. That's probably what I'm going to have to do. Okay. Uh, also, just a quick question. Do we have a live lecture um, on Monday the 5th? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No live lecture on the 5th. We're observing the Independence Day holiday. So there's a pre-recorded lecture you can look at, um, which uh, we'll substitute for that live session on that particular day. Okay, and that will uh, show up on that day or do we already have it on their own modules? You've already, you've already got it, it's already up. Okay, thank you. Yep, just making sure. About that. Okay. Absolutely, yep. All right, I'll get on this as soon as we uh, exit here. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what the problem is. Um, something with the calendar, maybe. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. So that'll be my, uh, my issue to solve this afternoon. Um, anything else come to mind uh, from anybody or shall we uh, adjourn at this point in time? Um, I was actually looking uh... To the like the camera user manual and the checkout forms and all that mm -hmm. um and i tried to look at the checkout instructions for it but that link doesn't seem to work oh so, good yeah <laughs> that's we another, that another for us. let me tell you where that link goes in fact let me show you the ucf portal do you guys know the operational portal are you aware of that yet UCF operational portal. This is the film department's operational portal. Can you see that okay if I move this over? Yeah. All right. So, uh, service desk, equipment, facilities, training, events, resources, incoming students, and links. This is the comings and goings of the UCF film department from the point of view of the operations desk, which is the folks that have all the gear that you're gonna to wanna to check out when you do your, your uh, projects for this class and for other classes, okay? So if you needed to check out equipment, uh, here, you see film equipment room, address, email, phone number, hours of operation, okay? Right. Zeus Now Portal, Express Checkout, okay? services and information it's all in here if you hit the zeus portal now uh it'll ask you for your uh sign on information for uh, my my ucf log in and it will take you to some of the same stuff uh plus more uh that i have posted on that page i will get the um current link from them though and solve that so i want to write that down as well 
So we have. Uh, yeah. So it will be through the the Nicholson building then, for the yes. uh, for the equipment. Okay. Because I, I had previously done it through the the library, but I know my my buddy he's gone through the film major as well, and he was saying that Nicholson has their own like thing, so that, that handles yeah. their own equipment. The so library. I, I was trying to figure out where I needed to go. <laughs> The library has video equipment and that anybody with a UCF student ID can check out right. that gear from the library. The stuff on the Zeus portal through the operational portal is equipment that is for the exclusive use of students enrolled in the film program. So if you're not in the film program and if you're not enrolled as a student in the film program, you can't check out any equipment from the operational portal. Okay, that's the difference. So um, you want to deal with us here at Operational Portal if you want to check out one of those Panasonic cameras for your homework assignment, okay? Right. Um, that's not to say that you couldn't go to the library if there was stuff available, what, but what are the chances that they're going to have stuff available when you need it when all 52,000 of us can access that resource through the library? Right. And only about 600 of you can operate the access the resources through the operational portal. You got a better shot at getting your gear through uh, through this web page. Um, so I'm looking at Zoom and I'm looking at Zeus. Um, okay, I think that was it for uh, this morning. Okay. Um, anything else come to mind? Uh, I had one question and this is more of a technical question um if i want and i was looking at the uh, the the cook lenses love the s4 mm -hmm. um would that be able to mount on a micro four thirds uh sensor uh, like for the gh5 or do i have to get an adapter for that <laughs> well that's a pl mount uh lens system that's a positive locking lens system it was designed by um uh, I think Panavision designed it initially. Uh, Airy used a version of it as well. Um, and it became sort of an industry standard for cinema lenses over time uh, in a period of history where there weren't all these uh, um, lens manufacturers uh, competing with products uh, that can be used in digital cinema. It was, it was something that came out of the film days of, of, of uh, feature filmmaking. Um, so the problem, the logistics of putting a PL mount lens on a micro four thirds camera um, have to do with what we call flange focal distance um, or flange focal depth. Um, and it has to do with the mount and the space uh, between the lens mount itself, the very last element in line inside that lens barrel and the actual sensor. There has to be a prescribed uh, focal distance there that needs to be precisely applied. So when you put the lens on the camera, that distance has to be guaranteed every time you mount that lens on that camera so that the image will actually be in focus on the sensor uh, through the lens. The lens is really nothing more than a projection device. Okay, so the focus of that rear projection coming out of that lens is precisely X number of millimeters, depending on what camera we're talking about. Okay, so with your Panasonic GH5, uh, the flange focal depth of that camera is something like 18 millimeters. Okay, well, a PL mount lens, that mount flange itself and that rear element extends b beyond the PL flange by, I think, more than 18 millimeters. You wouldn't even be able to physically mount that lens on that camera. Uh, and if you were to use some kind of what we call a flange adapter, uh, it would not be able to maintain the appropriate flange focal distance for that camera. So I don't know that there exists a way of putting a PL mount lens on a micro four thirds camera. There might be, somebody might have figured out an adapter by now um, that may be possible. One of the issues that you will encounter with putting a cinema lens on a micro four thirds camera will have to do more with the projection size or the image circle produced by that lens. So a micro four thirds sensor, I happen to have a really interesting uh, 
diagram here. Um, and it has to do with the sizes of sensors, their dimensions physically. Okay, so if you look at uh, the relationship here, here's your Panasonic GH5 camera. This is a graphic illustration that approximates uh, almost to real size, the size of a, of a micro four third sensor. Now, the, uh, the Cook S4 lenses are designed to function in a system called Super 35. Okay, which is um, the old film four perf 35 millimeter standard, which is over here. You see the size of this red square that says film, super 35 bigger. four perf. It's much bigger, isn't it? So that means that the projection out of the backside of that Cook lens is designed at a predis predisposed distance to cover a square this big. When you adapt that lens to the GH5, it will take care of the prescribed pre distance, but it, what it won't fix is the image circle projection. It'll still be a lot larger than the sensor it needs to cover. And as a result, it will create the, an apparent magnification of the image. And really what it is, is you'll have an image circle projected over the sensor that's much bigger than the recording area in the camera. And therefore some stuff, some image will get cropped out, okay? And when it gets cropped away, what's left is only the stuff that covered the sensor, which when you map that on a, what, what we call a full raster image, which is the full size of your video monitor, it looks like it's been magnified. And the magnification factor is a mathematical uh, difference between the diagonal of super 35 and the diagonal of micro four thirds. If you were to divide these into one another, you'll get some factor, right? So what is 31.1 divided by 21.64? Let's see. 31 divided by 20, let's say 21. Point six. It's about 1.4 times. So if you have a Cook S4 50 millimeter lens and you want to put it on a Panasonic GH5, you'll a 50 millimeter lens is about what you see with your, your naked eyes minus anything you could see with your peripheral vision. Okay, that's why we call a 50 millimeter a standard lens. It's basically what your eye sees in terms of magnification. But when you put it on your GH5, it's 50 millimeters times 1.4. Mm -hmm. Which is really a 70 millimeter lens. So the resulting image on your GH5, if you could adapt the Cook S4 to it, would have the appearance of a 70 millimeter telephoto lens, not a 50 millimeter standard lens. So using the 1.4 reproduction uh, ratio, uh, you would have to pick a lens probably, let's see what a 35 millimeter translates to. 49. You'd have to put a 35 millimeter Cook lens on your GH5 to get the same performance visually that you would get out of a 50 millimeter lens on a film camera or on a camera with a sensor that's this size, Super 35, like the Blackmagic Design Ursa Mini or uh, the red uh, Scar Scarlet and the red, uh, I think the red Genesis is Super 35. Um, the red um, uh, Raven is Super 35. Uh, Aria Alexa is Super 35. Um, is Z camera E6S is Super 35. Um, there's a number of cameras out there that have this size sensor, but 50 millimeters is only 50 millimeters on this size sensor. On this sensor, right. it's 70 millimeters. Does that make sense? And I'm sure that'll affect, yes, sir. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll affect the, um, I guess the, the megapixels, the quality of the actual images itself. Well, the resolution, the resolution of the lens itself is much higher than the digital requirements of a digital image. So you're, you're all right as far as that's concerned. You're not, um, it's not the same thing as magnifying an image off the sensor. You're magnifying the image from the projection, which is different, okay? So it'll be just as sharp. Uh, any of the outstanding qualities of the optics will be matched over here 
from over here. It's just that over here on the smaller sensor, it appears to be more magnified, but it's not because the image off the sensor has been increased. Like when you, when you digitally zoom in on your cell phone, it starts to pixelate and block up and fall apart in terms of image quality. That's because the image off the sensor is being magnified. That's when you see all of the imperfections uh, in quality from magnifying the image off the sensor. It's not working the same way optically. Okay, optically, it's much different. Um, so it'll be just as sharp. It'll just look like it's 70 mil instead of 50. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Sure. Let's just see who's got PL to micro four thirds, just to, to give you a thorough answer to your question here. Let's go uh, PL mount lamp to Panasonic GH5. Okay, we've got some Metabone. See, because this one looks nice, Metabone. but it's just smooth. So like it'll it can literally just slide right out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking for something that looks good, but it's like this, like arched, where you have to like lift up to get it out. Here's here's your metabone PL to micro four thirds. Here's your prohibitive factor right here. It's a little pricey. It's a little bit pricey, right? I mean, you could actually who's playing the guitar right now? What is that? <laughs> um, you you could almost buy a GH5 body for this right now. Uh, in fact, especially with the GH5 Mark II that just was announced, uh, I think right now the going price on a GH5 body used is about 800 bucks. So, I mean, you're paying just as much for the adapter as you are for the camera, right? To right. use those Cook S4s on your GH5. Uh, but it's nice to know that it can be done, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here's here's the solution. Now, what you could do, here, here's, here's something you could do. I mean, if you were really curious about this and you wanted to try it, um, you could go to a, a, a rental house like, uh, let's see, who's over here? There's a group right over here near UCF. Uh, Lens Depot, I think. Yeah, Oviedo. These guys are right next to, well, not right next to UCF, but they're very, very close to UCF. They're about, I don't know, maybe three miles away, four miles away, right? Uh, if we go there to their website and in the search box, let me put uh, Metabones. See what they got. Oh, please. Let's see. Panasonic. <laughs> Cameras, lenses, adapters. Here, oh, here we go. Panasonic. Mm -hmm. Okay. EF. Canon to MFT. Oops, excuse me. Nikon to MFT. MFT with aperture built in. Uh, I don't see PL to MFT, but let's try that. Let's go... Um, Metabones, all one word, PL to, how do they do it? MFT adapter. And you got to hit their magnifying glass. Do they have one? Eh, it's not looking good. Um, you might call them and ask them. Uh, and if yep. they don't have it, I know you can rent them from like Sammy's camera. You could rent them from, you could probably rent one from Adorama. Um, you know, you'll have to find a rental resource online um, and then try it. Rent the Cook S4 lenses or one of them and, and a Metabones adapter and, and see what you think. Uh, the Cook S4 lenses are pretty big. I can tell you that right now. Um, and they are, one of the reasons why they're pretty big is they're handmade and they're manufactured to work with full-size uh, professional uh, cinema cameras. That's one reason. Right. Another reason is their rate of rotation is very, very long because follow focus 
uh, apparatus and focus pulling camera assistants like to have that long throw so they can give you nice smooth uh, focus transitions in the course of a shot. Um, so the barrels are very big. Um, and right. they and they are, I believe, uh, T 1.3 or 1.4 lenses. So they're, they're allowing a lot of lens to pass through uh, the glass at one time to create good exposures and low light uh, areas on set. Uh, for all those reasons, they're very large lenses. Uh, but if you went and looked at uh, mini S4s, for instance, uh, they're much smaller and much more easily adapted to the Panasonic GH5. Their minimum f-stop, the brightest, widest aperture you can achieve on them is 2.8. So they're not as good in low light as the S4 full size. Uh, but if you just wanted to see the quality of the Cook lens, and what it can do uh, at that price point, which for mini S4s is about $8,000 a piece. <laughs> um, yeah. You'll see what the big boys are shooting with on Hollywood movies because the Cook lenses uh, are working behind the scenes on a lot of major feature films. So um, you could do that. I mean, as an exercise in research or curiosity for your own sake, um, you know, Almost anything is possible in the age of digital technology and digital equipment options. Um, they're not always cost effective, but they're certainly possible because, you know, the studios will spend $200 million on a movie. This is part of the reason why movies are so expensive is because, you know, rental prices are high, equipment costs are high, um, you know, the cost of crew uh, is high. Um, so these are the costs that, that factor into uh, filmmaking. but. It, the, the gear is out there and it's uh, and you can try it. Um, Lens Depot deals with UCF students all the time. So there are uh, existing arrangements, rules and things in place. Like um, we have insurances that cover you when you rent from them. And there's things like that uh, um, that are in place for UCF students at Lens Depot because they're right down the street. You might not have the same considerations from a national company like Adorama or um, Lens Pro to Go, you know, somebody like that, uh, you might have different um, uh, expectations to fulfill, like security deposits and things uh, that you might not have at Lens Depot. Um, but, you know, check it out. And if it's something that you want to do, um, it's certainly, uh, you know, certainly within the realm of possibility. If you happen to have any friends that attend school at Full Sail, I can tell you that Full Sail owns at least two sets of mini S4s that I'm aware of. Um, and you might be able to visit Full Sail uh, under the supervision of your friend and uh, check out the S4s over there. I know that they have them. <coughs> but um, all right. Those yeah, are I mean, I. I always love experimenting with different things with film. So if I'm able to get my hands on, you know, the, the cook lenses or, or the adapter or the meta bones or whatever, I, I'm definitely going to play around with it. If you want to play, I'll tell you a cost effective way to play with cook lenses. If you really want to just see what the cook look is, um, cook in the very beginning in the, uh, I think they opened up shop in the mid to late 1800s. Cook Optics back then was known as Taylor Hobson. And Taylor Hobson is located in the UK. You could go online on eBay, for instance, and buy an old Taylor Hobson uh, Cinema Prime for a 16 millimeter camera um, for a few bucks. You know, there's some that are on there as cheaply as 50, 50 60 bucks and uh, get a... Um, a uh, and they would be in C mount because the old 16 millimeter cameras in uh, the 60s, 50s, and 60s were all used what we call a C mount, a universal thread mount. Uh, you get a C mount to micro four thirds adapter, and you can put a little Taylor Hobson lens on your GH5. It'll vignette a little bit in the corners because 16 millimeter is a smaller uh, recording media than micro four thirds. Um, but you could see what the quality of the lens is. Um, and moreover, if you wanted to go to the operational portal here at school and rent the um, pocket cinema camera HD from UCF, that has a super 16 millimeter digital sensor in it. 
it will correspond almost directly to the 16 millimeter frame size of a film camera. You could adapt the C mount Taylor Hobson to the Blackmagic Pocket HD camera, and you won't have much of a reproduction ratio to deal with, and you'll have uh, not as much vignetting. You'll see more of a one-to-one -one relationship of the quality of the lens, and then you'll see how amazing the the uh, the Taylor Hobson glass performs. All right, okay. well, I'm going to try that out for sure. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, folks, what do you say? Anybody hungry yet? <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm ready to take a nap. Um, yeah, time. yeah. I got a couple of other requests that I need to fulfill. All right. So, so you want to? You guys want to adjourn? Yeah, I'm thinking I'm I'm good. We got we got the readings and all that to get to still. So okay, to get on that. Good. All right, so we got a motion to adjourn. Anybody got a second? I second that. Right. Second. I, I, I third it. I fourth it. I fifth it. All right, the motion carries, and this meeting is adjourned. Thanks for all of your attention. Thanks for hanging out this long. We went a little bit longer than I intended, but that was all good, good questions. So I will see you folks on Wednesday. I will see if I can uh, fix any of these issues by then. Um, but you should plan on meeting again. Uh, we'll use uh, we'll use this link, and um, I will see you folks 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Right. Thanks, folks. Thank you, sir. Thank have you, a good sir. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Keep jamming on the guitar, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.